All right, and welcome back to the Shared Breaker podcast. We are here with episode three of Mistborn, the Hero of Ages. I am here with Darkness. Hello. Mythic. Hello. And I am Midnight. I'm the host of this podcast. Uh, and yeah, this time we did chapters 14 through 21 uh, this week. Uh, and also started part two called Cloth and Glass, which I'm sure you guys have realized what that's uh-huh. about. <laughs> that you got cut off there, Mythic. I said, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we'll go right into the epigraph first uh, for chapter 14, which is, Ruin's consciousness was trapped by the Well of Ascension, kept mostly impotent. That night, when we discovered the well for the first time, we found something we didn't understand. A black smoke clogging one of the rooms. Though we discussed it after the fact, we couldn't decide what that was. How could we possibly have known? The body of a god, or rather, the power of a god, since the two are really the same thing. Ruin and preservation inhabited the power and energy in the same way a person inhabits flesh and blood. Uh, so what did you think about that, about this black smoke being ruin, technically? Yeah, yeah. makes sense. I mean, they say it's his body, right? Yeah, it's his body oh. slash his power slash the same thing. Mm-hmm. But explain how it can infiltrate people's minds so easily. I don't know. You don't say here. Oh, no, I'm just saying, I said it would explain. Oh, it would how explain. They, how how, <laughs> how it can infiltrate. Did you say darkness? Black. What color is the mist? Oh, the mist? The actual mist? The yeah. mists, I think, are, like, gray or something. Did they give it I don't know. I was pretty sure they're white. What's the color of the mist? <laughs> All of a sudden, the mists are, like, purple and red. And <laughs> I think it's... Similar to like the color of ordinary mist, there's not like a specific color on like that black smoke. It's just like a grayish white. I was just wondering if like imagine the mist itself, like the original one, mm-hmm. is preservation's body, quote unquote, and then uh, and then the black one is like ruin's body, possibly. So you think the mists in general are preservation then, not ruin? Maybe. Right. That's a possibility, yeah. Possibi- everything's a possibility until we get confirmation. <laughs> exactly. A lot. Kelsey being alive is a possibility, and it's not happening. Oh, yeah, that, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll well, we can go. We can, we we'll can go get to that, that part. Yeah, we'll mm-hmm. go into I'll that. that shit real quick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll, we'll go into that. <laughs> but first, uh, we have uh, Spook's first chapter because he gets multi. I think it's three chapters. Is it three chapters, two or three chapters. Uh, this episode, lots of Spook. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we start with Spook's point of view as he flares tin. Uh, he never turns it off, as tin is the slowest burning metal, and also one of the easiest to obtain in necessary mounts for allomancy. As he walks down the street, he notes that he is uh, he has been told to flare his metal, not to fl- flare his metal too much, as he'd become dependent on it, and it could be dangerous to his body. And Spook notes that they were right. He had been flaring tin nonstop for a year, and it had changed him. To him, the stars in the sky were like mini suns, and the mist seemed weak. And at first, he had thought uh, seemed weak. And at first, he thought the world was changing, until he realized it was his perception that was changing. His senses were now far beyond normal Alamancers. Spook had started flaring tin when clubs died, and he had felt incredibly guilty about leaving his uncle in Luthadel. He had forced himself to flare tin so that he would feel everything to the point of pain. He had noticed he had started to change and almost stopped, but he knew Vin always pushed herself past her limits and wanted to see if he could also give himself an advantage, even though he only had one medal. His eyesight was now so enhanced that the starlight felt like daylight, and during the day he had to wear cloth over his eyes and still be almost blinded. His sense of... Uh, touch made everything he stepped on feel like knives stabbing into the soles of his feet through his shoes and the chilled spring air felt like freezing uh so what did you think about spook's constant use of tin and his reasons for doing it sounds awesome honestly i mean that made me you know when he was describing that it made me wonder if like he and uh straff was it Mm -hmm. Straff, Straff, yeah. yeah straff that made me wonder if they like what's it called again when you like Activate your elementic powers. Snapping? Yeah, I wonder if they, like, snapped again. Mm. That's, that's, what, that's what my, like, first thought went through. Because it seemed like they were special or whatever. I mean, Spook's always been special, so... I mean, we do in one of the epigraphs get a, an explanation. Mm-hmm. Yes. Get into. I think it's in I'm saying, chapter. like, at that moment. Yeah, that's at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Yep, Spook's a badass. Spook's gonna be the next Alamancer. <laughs> you mean the next Mistborn? He's nope. already an Alamancer. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's totally what I meant this point. <laughs> I'm like, he, he's been an Alamancer. Nah, nope, he's gonna be, he's, he's gonna be the best Mistborn ever. 
ever since the first book when you said you liked spook i'm like oh he's he's gonna love book three <laughs> we just gotta wait to get I to book spook. three spook's awesome i wish he would speak the uh, speak his correct tongue uh, but, you know. no he, oh my he god i forgot he used to speak like that yeah he used to speak in his eastern street slang but he bring no longer him does that. back bring yeah. him back. <laughs> i feel like it, i feel like that's gonna come in handy at some point because spook needs to be you know it's gonna be the guy. He's that, gonna you know, run that into like people that speak that shit, and he's gonna be like, he's gonna be like, I got this, I got this. Like, <laughs> yeah, like I, I feel like uh, the what, either the um, Coloss or the uh, what are the fuck's that? Conjure. Fuck. Yeah, or the Conjure are gonna be like oh, your royal blood or something because he speaks <laughs> this fucking different Interesting. language. Interesting. Yeah, and they'll be like, no. you don't need to pay us anything. We will just listen to you. Clearly, he's gonna like merge into Star Wars, and then he's gonna be talking to Jar Jar Binks. Okay. Uh, so Spook, <laughs> one, Spook wanted to be useful to the crew, as he felt he was the least useful member of the original crew. He hadn't even been picked by Kelsey or like the rest. Instead, he had just been brought along by default since he was Clubs' nephew. He had been given only simple tasks of running errands or keeping watch, which he felt was justified, and his dialect made him hard to understand. Spook knew he wouldn't have been able to help during the siege of Luthadel, but he had been sent specifically to Urtu to I struggle with the name of the city. Ur Urto, maybe? Uh, to gain as much information as he could about the citizen and the government here. So he would do his best to be useful, even if it meant pushing himself past his limits. He thinks that he may not be a misborn or an emperor, but he's something new, something Kelsier would be proud of, and maybe someone who could help. Uh, so do you think Spook is being realistic in his thoughts on himself, or is he being too hard on himself regarding his like value? Uh... I mean, he's definitely valuable, for sure. He's going to be the best, you know. I meant more on like him looking back on himself in the past. He felt like he he wasn't really a help to the crew back when Kelsier was around. He wasn't. And I just remember Mythic being like, because I, I had said that one time, and I was like, oh yeah, he's just kind of there. And Mythic's like, no, he's their one tin eye. He's so important. Because he's like, he watched that. I just remember Mythic really pushing back on that, which is why I thought I'd ask that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's going to be... Amazing. He, he, well, that's where he's going him. to be. I, I'm saying, do you think his it's, thoughts on himself in the back in the past are accurate? I know you think he's going to be the most amazing thing ever. I'm just saying, like, yeah. do you think he was useful back in the past? Yes, or? yes. Okay. He's our only ten eye. Of course, he's useful. <laughs> they have Mistborn. It's fine. Because <laughs> they have a Mistborn doesn't mean that they don't need uh, Mistings that are excelling in their. Uh, try not to use. Was the he other. though? Because apparently he wasn't yes. doing that well. Uh, he was. He was though. I don't know. Uh-huh, that's why he went with Vin, and he, you know, basically, you know, it was her, like, bodyguard and helping her out, you know. He went with Vin because he had a little crush, you know. <laughs> no, not not after. Not after she was already with Ellen. Okay, but that was, like, second book, so. Uh, so Spook wanders down the street, hiding when a patrol comes nearby. Once the patrol moves, so does Spook. He plans to listen in on a conversation between the citizen and his aides. As he walks, he notes that this was the city where the Ventures originally came from, but it had been in decline for a while, even before the Lord Ruler fell. It used to have canals running through it, but it now just had dusty troughs that grew muddy in the rain. Instead of being filled in, the canals were now used as roads. The buildings came right up to the sides of the canal, and in places there were ladders, ramps, or stairs that led up to the buildings and sidewalks. Uh, Spook then smells smoke, although he can't, uh, he can't be sure how recent it is due to his acute sense of smell. Uh, at first, he glances at a noble house that had been burned down a while ago, but then he thinks it smells too recent to be that. Spook thinks about how Urto Ur is dying and decaying because of its ruler, the citizen. Because of its ruler, the citizen. He also thinks about how Elland, on the night the Lord Ruler died, had given a speech about how dangerous hatred and rebellion could be. And Spook was seeing these exact dangers here in Urto. At first, the city had overthrown the nobility. However, the rebellion hadn't stopped there, and now the city was a place of fear and death. Uh, so what did you think about the description of Urto? Sounds like a wonderful city. <laughs> okay, I I don't know. I liked it because it was martial law, in my opinion. Uh, I liked that. It. It's really cool. You, you like that? Okay. Yeah. Oh, I, I like that there's a difference. Like, it's not just mm. the same in every city, you know? Yeah. Uh, so Spook goes up on a ladder, and, wa uh, and he originally wants to go down a side street, but he can hear a guard checking on the street as per usual. Instead, he goes to the guardhouse and begins listening for whispers or heartbeats and placing his hand on the building to feel for vibrations of movement. Eventually, he finds an empty bedchamber and goes inside the guardhouse and up to a storage room on the third floor. He uses this room to oversee the citizen's home, which likely used to belong to a minor nobleman. Uh, he sees a young woman with auburn hair wearing a brown ska dress uh, leaving the citizen's home. Her name was Beldry, Beldry, and she was the citizen's sister. She moves to sit on a bench near a single shrub, 
apparently the citizen who decided that ornamental plants were a luxury of noblemen that had been made using skull labor, thus they were to be removed. The people of the city had also whitewashed murals and shattered any stained glass windows. Uh, what do you think about all the noble-related things that the citizen is getting rid of? You know, before finding out what we find out later, I was like, I, I mean, like, that's fair, you know. Yeah, I agree, honestly. Like, before we found out about the shit from after, but... Uh, so Spoot thinks that he is here to listen to the Citizen's Nighttime Conference, however, seeing Beldre was an added bonus. The Citizen likes to keep his sister close, but not let her overhear meetings, so seeing her outside meant that the meeting was about to start. Spook was able to listen in from his building with his enhanced hearing, although a normal Mistborn or Tinai would not have been able to hear anything. Spook hears Kel- uh, Quellian, the Citizen, and Olid, the Foreign Minister, speaking about how Ellen had taken an unimportant town and then taken all of its citizens away from the town, leaving it abandoned. They also mentioned that Ellen got another Kolos army. Spook is happy to hear that that means they had gotten another of the storage caverns. Olid then mentions that Ellen is sending an ambassador to come speak with them about a treaty. Spook is excited to hear about this, however, Kellyan calls the crew liars, and that Erto is the only city that accomplished Kelsier's goal of a Ska-run nation. Spook notes that he finds it odd to hear someone he doesn't know speak about Kelsier. The men then go on talking about laws and trying to find people with noble parentage. Spook takes notes, but his eyes trail back to Beldre as he wonders about her and wishes he could go down and speak with her. He thinks that he isn't a misborn, however, and his is of what his way is that of stealth. So what do you think about the conversation that Spook was listening in on? Without knowing what we know after? Yeah, just generally. Uh-huh. I think they weren't wrong. They were doing exactly as before, like, you know, when Kelsey was saying what he he wanted, so. Without knowing about their hypocrisy. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I mean, yeah, without knowing about how they're hypocrites, but. Yeah, they'll talk about that after you find out technically mm-hmm. about that. Uh, what do you think, Darkness? Do you have any thoughts about their kind of conversation? Yeah, when it was happening, I was just thinking how it sucks that things can be so out of perspective for other people who aren't there. Low key, I can imagine how angry he, uh, uh, Spook would be. And I also feel like, considering Kelsier was a Mistborn, like I don't think he'd be super uh-huh. pleased about them like killing Ska with noble parents. He's like, no, yeah. no, there's there's still Ska, <laughs> like. Yeah. As long as they weren't a pure noble raised in noble society, like, it's fine, dude. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Because, you know, I didn't have to answer without that. Exactly. I was also thinking about, like, like he changed his mind because of Ellen, right? Like, no mm-hmm. one knows that, though, because it was, like, a second before his death, mm-hmm. pretty much. Yeah, which kind of sucks, but okay. <laughs> yeah. He was coming around a little bit. If he had lived longer, maybe he would have come around a bit more to certain nobles. I think he probably yeah, still would have hated long and prosper, you know? <laughs> I think he probably still would have uh, hated most nobles, but I think he may have had a couple exceptions. I, w- I would I mean, have loved to he, see Kelsier he, he, no, he didn't know, uh, Bree- he didn't know Breeze was a noble, though, either, did he? No, I don't think he knew that Breeze was a noble. Yeah, he did. I'm pretty sure Breeze keeps it a secret. I'm pretty sure, yeah, I'm pretty sure he, does. I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have uh, put him yeah. on the crew, in all honesty. Because he very much had a hatred for nobles. And, like, considering they, they state specifically that, like, he had left a note that his plan was to put, like, those crew members in charge, like, I doubt he would have put mm-hmm. a... Especially at the start of his plan, I doubt he would have put a nobleman in charge. Yeah. I, I just think that, you know, obviously Breeze hid that, you know? Yeah. And I think in one of his point of views in the last book, I think, he, he mentions that, like, he, he hasn't told the crew and he, like, tries mm-hmm. to hide that. I think Sage is one of, like, the few people that knew about it. It, yeah. it might... Like, because we don't get to see, like, because obviously we have year skips in between the books, so, like, it, the crew might know now, but they definitely didn't during the first book. Mm-hmm. I feel like that would be a big thing to show, you know, if they know now. Um, I mean, they could show it, but I don't think that would sway anyone like Kellyon, Quellion, because he'd be like, well, he tricked, he tricked Kelsier into believing oh, yeah. that he was a Ska. Look how evil he is. <laughs> but he wouldn't know that he didn't tell Kelsier. I mean, it, it depends. We don't know. Ke- Kellyon's kind of like being a bit extremist with the the Kelsier view, so I, I doubt he'd be any less <laughs> uh, vengeful against the nobles. Uh, but yeah, so that was the end of chapter 14. Mm. And get to chapter 15. Uh, the epigraph is The Ash. I don't think the people really understand how fortunate they were. During the thousand years before the collapse, they pushed the ash into rivers, piled it up outside cities, and generally just let it be. Uh, they never understood that without the microbes and plants Rashik had developed to break down the ash particles, the land would quickly have been buried. Though, of course, that did eventually happen anyway. Um, did you have any thoughts about these plants that break down the ash? 
kind of more of like a little history lesson. Right. Um, say, uh, we got a lot of those. Get a lot of little scholarly tidbits, just kind of explaining how the world works and why. Mm-hmm. Which is great. I love it. Mm-hmm. It's kind of just doesn't it, make the please. most. Sometimes the questions don't come easily, though. It's kind of just like good fact. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, were you gonna say something, darkness? I forgot what those people are called that are like always advocating for like nature and all that shit. Ruins. <laughs> like in what context? Uh, do you mean? Huh? Like in, like in, in real life or like? In like in real context? life. Hippies? Like environmentalists? I guess. So, Rush, I guess, was, he was just a hippie, babe. <laughs> I mean, he was a simple pastoral, like, Parisman before becoming he's, the Lord Ruler. He's just trying to, like, take care of nature, you know, you know, making sure he doesn't die and everything. He's, like, standing outside the fucking buildings with, like, post, pro- protester signs, you know? <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so we have Vin's point of view for this chapter as she thinks about the mists. She notes that the mists move away from her when she uses Allomancy. She wonders what is different with the mists and thinks that they seem to move more rapidly, as if they are quivering and vibrating. She had asked both Says and Ellen about the mists, and both had argued for them being natural or something else, although Says had eventually said he thought them to be natural, with Ellen not really giving a firm answer. He just kind of argued both sides. Uh, Vin thinks of them as something else, though. She th- she said, uh, as she felt that she could feel them grow more po- potent when she had touched the Well of Ascension. They also disappeared too quickly in the light and didn't go indoors, not even to cloth tents. Finn then thinks briefly about Tensoon as she notes she missed him a lot more than she thought when she would. She had apparently tried to find a Chondra to send a message to him, but the Chondra were scarce lately. What do you think about the fact the Chondra aren't around? Do you think there's a, what, what reason do you think that are, is for that? Well, what's happening with Tensoon, right? You think it's just? I was just wondering, like, do you think it's because of Tensoon? Do you think it's because like the Lord Ruler is gone, or like uh, a third reason potentially? Do you think well, it's because not, of Tensoon? It's not because of the Lord Ruler being gone, because they were still there, mm-hmm. after, and, like in the second book. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, well, at least two of them were, but we know at least mm-hmm. Orisur had. But, a, but they were a already they before. were already out beforehand, though. Yeah, so. we don't know if anyone's been sent out since the Lord Ruler died, but there were Chandra mm-hmm. out from potentially from previous uh, missions. Because Tensoon also was working with Ellen's family from before the Lord Ruler yeah. died, because we saw him briefly in the first book. Yep. Uh-huh. We didn't see any other Chandra, before, you know, other than them. So that we know of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That we know, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, after all, they are master shapeshifter spices. Yeah, apparently they have ridiculously cool fucking powers. <laughs> I was like, that makes a lot more sense now on some things, you know, once that was brought to light. I was like, ooh, how they get information that they mm-hmm. shouldn't have. Yeah, we'll get to that uh, during Tensu's mm-hmm. chapter. Yep, 100%. Uh, but yeah, Mythic, uh, do you, do you, what reason do you think there is for the Conjure not being around? Because Darkness said he thought maybe it was more about Tensu. I mean, I, that's kind of what I'm thinking, too, to be honest. But... You think it's mainly about t- because of Tensoon that they're all yeah. hanging out at the homeland? I hate yeah. when you do that shit, because I know it's going to be more than just that. It's not always! I'm just curious what your thoughts are. No, I think, I think I definitely think it's, like, I don't know if it's just Tensoon, but I think it's, like... Part a, of the reason, at least? A, yeah, it's probably a big reason, you know? They don't know who she has told, and, you know, they're trying to keep everybody safe. Mm-hmm. In some way, shape, or form, even though I don't like them at all, but you know, <laughs> that's that's a, that's never here nor there. So, uh, so now that the mess had been gone for the morning, the army was quick to come out and begin cooking and working. Finn finds that most men don't seem to know what to think about her, as she is technically their empress, although she doesn't wear royal garb. She is also seen as a religious figure, as the heir of the survivor, but she doesn't like either title. Finn then finds Ham and Ellen discussing how Ellen wants to expose the army to the mess. Ham is against it, asking Ellen if he'd really kill off some of the men in his army, but Ellen argues they have no choice and can't wait out the mists every morning. Ham looks to Vin for agreement, but she agrees with Ellen, asking what would happen if they were attacked in the morning while the mists were still out. Ham looks upset and walks off. Vin then tells Ellen that Kelsier was wrong or yeah, Vin then tells Ellen that Kelsier was wrong about Ham. Kelsier had written a note uh, that had said he had chosen the crew members to lead the new government, and Ham was supposed to be the general. But Ellen mentions that Ham gets too involved with the men. Ellen then says they they talk too callously about the lives of the soldiers and wonders if they should be more like Ham. He then switches the subject and mentions that Finn's coloss is making the soldiers uncomfortable. Uh, so who, who do you agree with? Do you agree with Ellen or Ham regarding sending the soldiers out into the mists? I agree. I, I think it was a good idea. Pretty sure I... Yeah. That, that's what 
the best course of action was, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we had a brief discussion about it last time. But yeah, I th- as as they said, Ham Ham's a little too involved with the men, unfortunately. So he's he's yeah. struggling to look at things tactically. So Elman goes to check on the barges, giving Ben a quick kiss on the cheek uh, when he knows she's not going to come with him. Ben goes off to find Human. She finds him sitting near the perimeter of the camp, watching it. When she greets Human, he stands. And Ben asks why he came to camp, and he says it's because he is human and that he should have a house like the other soldiers. Ben replies that he is a colas, and those are tents, not houses. She tells him he should be with the other colas that are under uh, Ellen's control. She tells Human that he's making the soldiers uncomfortable, to which he replies that they should attack him then. Ben replies that humans don't do that, but humans says they make the Kolos do the killing for them instead. Like them. That was so good. Good line. Yeah, you make them do it. Yep. He might not be the most articulate, but he he's not stupid. At all. Well, <laughs> not stupid. You think, you think humans stupid, Darkness? Humans are definitely stupid. <laughs> yeah, that's true. He wants to be a human. <laughs> uh, so human then says that Vin is like them and not like the other humans. She asks why, and he says it's because of the mists. Ben prods him about the mists, and he replies that Kolos don't fear them, but that uh, he hates the mists because the mists hate them. Ben agrees that she feels like the mists hate her. She thinks that the mists aren't alive, that they can't hate her, but then she thinks back on how she had used the mists to defeat the ruler, and how she hadn't been able to do it since. Then there was the mist spirit, and the way the mists kept out of buildings and killed people. The mists, the deepness, hated her, and was her enemy. Uh, so why do you think the mists hate the Kolos, and that they can feel that? I mean, I thought about a lot of it, but like, honestly, there's not a lot that I can think of. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I just remembered a line, but it's like further down, which kind of answers this question. Oh. You could just, what, uh, which line? I think it's right after the end of this, like... Is it the epigraph? The epigraph, the next epigraph is about the Alimantic savants. It's after she's like, uh, Miss is my enemy now or whatever. Pretty sure she ends the chapter with that. I'm pretty sure it's after that where it gets answered. Well, to me. Let me look for you, hold on. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm quickly checking. Just... Uh, I do remember her saying that it's her enemy now. Yeah, no, the very last line is uh, the mists were her enemy. So the very last paragraph is, what are the hesitance she felt towards the mists? The way they pulled away from her. The way they stayed out of buildings and the way they killed. It all seemed to point to what human had said. The mists, the deepness, hated her. And finally she acknowledged what she'd been resisting for so long. The mists were her enemy. That's where mm-hmm. that chapter ends. So if you're thinking something, it might be okay. from like a different chapter with her in it that's coming up. Why are there so many fucking pages? Yeah, I know. It's... <laughs> Sorry. Maybe it is from somewhere else. Alright, do you want to try and mm-hmm. keep hold of that thought and we'll come back to it during one of our other chapters if you remember, if you find it? Yeah, because I, I don't remember. But I do remember that uh, it speaks of how some people can feel... Uh, it's anger towards, you know, the uh, people inside. She, she does go back to the logbook and think about how Lendi also felt like he felt like anger and uh, sentience from the deepness. It's the only thing I can think of off the top of my head relates to what you're talking about. No, it's because it says, from what I remember, it says uh, something about how, oh, it's, I know what it is. It's when they're discussing the percentages. Oh, oh yeah, way okay, later, the last chapter? Way later. Yeah. yeah, it's when they're discussing that. That's when it got answered for me, because they were like, uh, ah, fuck, I had it in my brain, but it was like 7 a.m., bro. Uh, man, we'll just wait. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll wait. We'll come back to it. Okay. Don't forget again. Let me go look for it, meanwhile. <laughs> Did you respond what to that was, question, Mythic? What was the question? Uh, why do you think the Miss hate the Coloss? Oh no! There's so many. There's so much that could be there. Honestly, <laughs> the mist. Like I, I started believing because, like, kind of like what Darkness said about like the, with the dark, the black mist or whatever that was in the uh, place. Mm, being ruined. They called ruin. Yeah, I was like, so maybe the white, like uh, the grayer mist or whatever that's out mm-hmm. that isn't killing people is preservation, it's power, and so you know maybe it doesn't like them because they're made of ruin. That's the, that's my glowing through at the moment. Mm. Okay. There's a darkness. Actually, no, I'm going to wait till that. Because okay. uh, I'm pretty sure Mythic's going to have the same fucking theory I am. <laughs> Alright, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that then in the last chapter. Just make sure you don't forget it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alright, chapter 16's epigraph, which is, I think, one of the best epigraphs for this episode. Uh, well, I don't agree with that, but then again, I, oh, think yeah. I, have an extra, I think I have an extra epigraph, so... Yeah, you might. <laughs> I think you usually do, because of the way the uh, yeah, audio book sure does it. Last, 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I don't remember which chapter, whether it was the chapter after the last, you know, epigraph or the that chapters, but I'll know when you say the epigraph. So, uh, they are called alimantic savants, men or women who flare their metal so long and so hard that the constant influx of alimantic power transforms their very physi physio physio. I can't say this word. Physiology. Physi physiology. Thank you. <laughs> In most cases, with most metals, the effects of this are very slight. Bronze burners, for instance, often become bronze savants without knowing it. Their range is expanded from burning the metal so long. Becoming a pewter savant is dangerous, as it requires pushing the body so hard in a state where one cannot feel exhaustion or pain. Most accidentally kill themselves before the process is complete. And in my opinion, the benefit isn't worth the effort. Tin savants, however, now they are something special. Endowed with the senses beyond what any normal alamancer would need or even want, they become slaves to what they touch, hear, see, smell, and even taste. Yet the abnormal power of these senses give them a distinct and interesting advantage. One could argue that, like an inquisitor who has been transformed by a hemolytic spike, the alimantic savant is no longer even human. So my first question here is, <laughs> what do you think about savants in general, and how they're not potentially even human? Repeat the whole thing, I didn't hear you. <laughs> you want what? To... <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, start this. I was, uh, when I first read that, I was like, oh shit, Vin is already, like, hella, you know? <laughs> Vin is... Yeah, because even the Colossus was like, ain't hey, human, bro. Yeah, oh yeah. But... What type of savant do you think she is? Because she's definitely not a tin one, based on what we've seen. A scared. trauma savant. <laughs> uh, I think she is... A... I think she's a Peter savant. Yeah, actually, yeah. 100%. Because I feel like she's been doing that forever. Yeah, she, and she like, would push herself the... really hard from like the second book on. <laughs> and the like, uh, and the pushing one, or whatever. Uh, mm. Steel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, no. What's the, oh, no, what's iron, the iron, steel pull iron push? Fuck. Whatever. Whatever. Which whichever. Which. Whichever. It is. But uh, <laughs> I, I, whichever I'm not pushes. Looking, I'm not looking at my list. Um, it's it could be a lot of them, but uh, I also think whatever the one that it's she could see through copper clouds or whatever. Oh. Uh, oh yeah. Brass. I think that's brass. Didn't yeah, she so... burn that like constantly? Uh, right. I don't know if she was. She she was burning pewter the most of anything. I think. No, oh, yeah. it's because like when she was patrolling and stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, she did. She did burn a lot. She burned um a lot. Yeah, quite a few metals a lot, but I don't think tin. Yeah. Not tin. I think, and I, think not... I think she's just definitely uh, a copper savant, if not like multiple, honestly, because she does burn. I'm going a for Peter because that girl I mean, is I like. She, I think she could be a savant of a lot of things. Though. Yeah, she. I think as a Mistborn, you could potentially be a savant of multiple different metals. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think Kelsier was a savant of fucking the push and pull, so. Yeah, I don't think he would have been a savant of any of the other ones, but because he really only knew used how to those that two. <laughs> he but, knew yeah. how to use that shit. Hey, imagine Breeze, bro. Yeah, yeah. Gonna, my, my second question here was Breeze actually. Already is a savant. Yeah, my my question here actually was going to be besides Spook, who we have confirmed is a savant. Uh, do you think any of the other Alamancers that we know of are savants? I know I Straff all, was. I think they're all savants. Uh, Straff was like definitely all, not. All. He didn't have to wear a cloth over his eyes and stuff. Yeah. yeah. He just, it was just enhanced. Like, a little better. You know, just a little bit. It's because uh, the, well, I guess, technically not, because he was, I guess, in the process of it or whatever. If you think about it, because... He, he but, uh, might have been, but I think... definitely think all of Kelsier's crew is a savant of their respective metal. Yeah. I, th I think, though, probably what you're thinking of Darkness is him being like, oh, I can feel the poison working on me. I think that was more just his withdrawal symptoms from the drug that we learn he's been ha taking without knowing. I think he uh -huh. just keeps feeling the withdrawal symptoms. I think that's what that's supposed to explain. You think so? Not actually him I, yeah, I, I don't think he's anywhere near being as Tin Servant. I don't think so. Yeah, no, he's definitely not spook level now. I think like it was all said, just you, like, you I'm in drug withdrawal. <laughs> I don't know, because there, there, there was like a lot of description into like, what he can feel and what he can't. The thing is, like, you can't just, as a tin user, you can't yes, just enhance you. one sense like no, you can as a ferrochemist. So he'd be also could... feeling all of the, like, sight and hearing and everything but as well. But you could lower... Yeah, but, like, it's only uh, affecting Spook that much because he's already a savant, so... But I'm saying, like, I, I'm pretty sure later it kind of, like, in, hinted on that you could, like, almost ignore the other parts you know it's like it's still there but you could ignore it so like it wasn't as bad to, on you after you've done it for so long yeah spook says like the, the 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 part you have to focus on about being tin is how to not just use your enhanced senses but how to like ignore the ones around you but i don't think that technically 
like stops you from feeling it. It like he he wouldn't be. Able I don't to know. Just, he got like, stabbed. He should have felt that well, he, real he fast. He does. And it took it. I, it took it a little bit. I think it's the adrenaline. I took like a second. I think. <laughs> He was like, I should have felt that, and then he immediately felt it. I'm pretty sure it's just fucking uh, adrenaline rushing through him. No, no, no. Yeah, it was him being... It's a like, he's, he's a god. He's, no, he's a zombie. Uh, but yeah, so you, you guys, you, I think you said you think Breeze is probably a servant, considering he's like using it as well like, all uh, the time. I think Breeze is a servant. I think uh, whatever the dude's name is that died, uh, that Clubs. was able to... Yeah, clubs. I think clubs was a savant. I think um, uh, fuck. Ham is definitely a probably a savant. I don't think Ham's a savant because his whole thing is oh, like shit. you only use oh, yeah, good. computer when you need it, and it specifically yeah. says in this paragraph that like use it all. all the time. That like it's so dangerous. Like you'd likely kill yourself before becoming a pewter savant. I think nah, Ham doesn't it. burn he's... it enough to become a savant. I think Ham. I think Ham's a savant of a lot of things. <laughs> I, I really don't think Ham's a savant. I, he's like the one that I'm like, I'm... Okay, well, what, don't well you know everything, so... Well, I don't, but I'm just saying, like... You know the whole thing. Yeah, Midnight. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, based on the description of go- becoming a pure savant, I, I don't think Ham is. We don't, we, don't know, we don't know Ham's life. I mean, we don't. That's true. Maybe he was burning it for a while. That's why he's so, you know, wary about it. He's like... I'm a savant, I know. My brain is not functioning correctly, because they're going to say, that's why he's so thick. (laughs) That is why he's so thick. (laughs) What the fuck? (laughs) Anyways. (laughs) So we go back to Spook's point of view for this chapter. Uh, As he wakes up, he has his eyes covered with a blindfold, the shutters of the windows closed, and even cloth over the shuttered windows to keep out the sunlight. He also has the blindfold over his ears and wax in his ears to lessen the sounds of footsteps in the hallway and in the rooms around him. Spook worries about these uh, these things leaving him vulnerable while sleeping, but he also knows that a lack of sleep is even more dangerous. Uh, so what do you think about how Spook has to like protect himself to even be able to sleep because of his enhanced senses? Cool. It would work, so, I mean, power-wise. Alright, uh, so Spook removes the I mean, cloth. As, as we find out later, consequences. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so Spook... Also, rem- oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. But, um, this is like in his room and everything, right? Yeah, this is like his. He's he's been staying at this inn, and he's been renting out. He this says room. it himself, bro. Right? He's like, "This is dangerous as fuck." Like, mm-hmm. but I got to do it, so I'm going to. Imagine getting ambushed, bro, right? and then he's like, "What the fuck is happening?" Because he could hear his fucking like a blast of everything. You know? I was wondering, like, imagine <laughs> he's like burning that shit, and you just get a pan and like a fucking pot, and you just start oh, no. banging that shit next to his ear. That would <laughs> suck. Uh, so yeah, Spook removes the cloth from his eyes and the wax from his ears as he gets up. He notes that he still has some tin in his stomach, although it's mostly gone as he'd burned away most of it while sleeping. Spook has a pail of tin dust that he has brought from Luthadel, and, ref- and he refills it by buying from the underground. It's a handful of tin dust Straight his- from the underground. <laughs> he puts a handful of tin dust in his mug and then goes to his door. He closes his eyes and opens the door to the hallway quickly, feeling around for the jug of water and bringing it into the room before quickly closing the door again. Do you think that a normal tin eye would be able to burn tin in their sleep, or is this specific to Spook because he's a uh, savant? Just because you asked that question makes me believe that. I think, I think uh, at that point, I think that, um, well, I thought that uh, every every Misty and every Mistborn should be able to burn metals like that. Just like as long as they, they've been burning it long enough. I feel like it just becomes second nature, like breathing, yeah? Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm curious what a fucking gold savant would be like. I'm so curious what a. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh my god, he would have a. Like. The the gold savant is the one that can see your past, right? Yeah, Maybe it sees your own see. past. He would have like he would be talking to all his demons, bro. Right? <laughs> Constantly. You you'd either go crazy or you'd be the most like self secure person. Self aware, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, ATM one. Yeah, yeah that's what I said. Mythic yeah. said that briefly. Yeah. What would an ATM savant be like? That's just, crazy. I wonder if you could just see more shadows the more you burn it. Or what like, if, like, all you see is shadows? Or you see, like, farther, like, longer seconds into the future? That's... I don't know if I would... Uh-uh. <laughs> uh, once the door is closed, he reopens his eyes and pours water into his mug so that he can drink the tin dust. He also puts a handful of tin dust into a pouch just in case he needs some more later. 
Spook then gets stressed, thinking about how he wants to get as much information as possible until whomever Ellen sent to Erto is arrives. Spook thinks that he normally would sleep through the daylight hours, but today he has something he needs to do. Grabs a pair of glasses out of just normal glass and ties the blindfold around them so that he can still have his eyes open while the cloth blocks out the light. He then makes his way over to the window and opens the shutters to reveal a burning hot sunlight. He then picks up his dueling cane and heads out. And then we skip to later in the day, where Spook is pretending to be a beggar with a man named Dern. They were in the market pit, a canal that had become the central boulevard, and now uh, mainly traders and beggars spend time there. Dern is wrapping two sticks on the ground as he speaks to Spook about how life here is better than, than when the noblemen were in charge. Dern says the Ska can now openly participate in commerce, unlike when the Lord Ruler was in charge. But Spook thinks that the people don't look happy and instead seem to quickly grab what they need to leave instead of, like, window shopping and wandering around. There are also two dozen soldiers watching the crowd. Dern then says that people aren't being beaten and killed in the streets, but Spook replies that the beatings and killings just happen in the alleyways instead of the, in the open. Dern continues to tap a rhythm with his sticks, and Spook thinks that he could be a master musician. The Ska weren't allowed to play music when the Lord Ruler was around, and now it was better not to draw attention to yourself. Uh, did you just have any thoughts about Dern as a character, as a person? Seems like a pretty cool guy to me. Oh, I, I like that he was like doing the little fucking stick thing in the tapping. Yeah, his, his little music that yeah. only Spook can hear. Yeah, but the thing is, like, in my head, I was trying to figure, like, what it would sound like. And for some reason... He in my head he was tapping the chicken dance. <laughs> okay, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> and then my other question was: Do you agree with Dern or Spook about whether the citizen is a better ruler than the Lord Ruler or equally as evil? He's just as bad, bro. Yeah, right. He's pretty much just as bad. I was gonna say he's disgusting. <laughs> Spook then watches the citizen and comments on his clothing, which Dern replies is normal. But Spook states that he's wearing red, which is apparently not an approved color. However, mm. Dern states... Approved colors. Mm. Yeah, they got approved colors here. Citizen citizen has approved colors. Uh, however, Dern states that the citizen just ruled this morning that the government officials could wear red so that they stand out and can be easily found when needed. Spook also notices that Beldra, the citizen's sister, is there. Dern comments on the group of prisoners briefly as the citizen begins to speak. The citizen talks about how they had worked hard to get rid of the nobleman in the city, and he mentions the survivor. He whis- uh, Dern whispers to Spook to count the prisoners, and Spook says there are ten, and that Dern isn't going to earn any coin. The citizen then says that the prisoners were hiding, uh, that they are noble, that they are nobility. The soldiers then push the prisoners into an oil-soaked building before barring the door and throwing lit torches on it. The people watching shy away from the burning building, and Spook can see fingers trying to pry the boarded windows open from the inside. He can hear people screaming inside and thumping against the barricaded door as they tried to get out. Spook thinks that he wanted to do something, but he can't fight soldiers with just tin, and he had been sent to gather information only. Uh, so what did you think about the citizen burning people alive in buildings? <laughs> You gotta do sacrifices to the gods somehow, you know? Just as bad as the Lord Ruler. Instead of doing public beheadings, you burn them live inside buildings. Low-key, I feel like the Lord Ruler was a little better, but okay. I mean, at least their deaths were quick when the Lord Ruler did it. Yeah. (laughs) Didn't have to be burned alive. Uh, Spook then whispers to Dern that things shouldn't be this way, but Dern replies that these men were nobles. Spook insists that they were just Ska, even if they had noble parents, and that they all had noble blood if you go back far enough. Dern tries to say that this is how the survivor wanted things, but Spook cuts him off and says not to speak his name in relation to this. Dern replies that he heard Kelsier speak once, and that if Spook had ever heard him, he'd once. understand. <laughs> Which, so, I mean, Spook obviously, he doesn't obviously know who Spook is. <laughs> no, but I, I, that was funny. I heard him speak once. <gasps> you would you would understand if you'd heard Kelsier speak. Spook's just like, tw- like eye twitching, being like, yeah, yeah dude, like, I spoke uh, to him on okay, a daily but... basis. <laughs> Spook thinks that Kelsier had preached death to all noblemen, but his words back then had been of hope, and now they were of death and destruction. It made him feel sick. Spook then says he doesn't want to hear citizen propaganda, just to know why he's here. Dern replies that he should count the skulls, and then leaves. After a moment, Spook moves as well to get some fresh air. He leans against a building and sees the citizen is going off into the market pit. Uh, after punishing, he needs to bless people. He often went to encourage people and shake their hands after an execution. Uh, so what do you think Dern means by count the skulls? How many skulls are there? So can... This is like, wait, hold on. This is where? Wait, so where is this happening? They're, they're watching the building burn. And uh, Dern, Dern said, hey, how, how many prisoners are there? And then Spook's like, I don't understand why I'm here. There's ten people. Like, why did you bring me here? And he's like, count the skulls. And then wanders off all mysterious. Like, <laughs> uh. I love how just like vague. He's like, count the skulls. And then just disappears into the crowd. <laughs> And it's weird because, like, he mentions it later. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Spook, Spook thinks about it again later. 
Mm-hmm. Does he count them? <laughs> no. uh, not, not, not during this episode, at least. Right. It's just, there's no counting. He doesn't have time to count the skulls. Uh, what, do you have any thoughts about what count the skulls means? Yeah. The skulls. <laughs> what skulls? The ones that, uh, where, all the, where all the dead people are. <laughs> In the building. Yeah. Huh. They're dead. Count them. Uh, so Spook takes a roundabout way to Market Pit, but he still arrives there before the citizen and his group. Spook thinks that the citizen wants to take Kelsier's legacy, but that he isn't the same as Kelsier and wasn't even worthy to utter Kelsier's name. He hears the citizen going around to people and telling them that the survivor would be proud of them and that the ash is a symbol from Kelsier of the fall of the Empire. Spook thinks about how he used to idolize Kelsier before even meeting him and had abandoned his eastern street slang after seeing how powerful words were when Kelsier used them. Uh, Spook makes his way through the crowd, no one paying any mind to the seemingly blind man. He eventually gets to the front of the crowd, so close to the citizen that he's like barely an arm's length away. He notes that he smells of smoke. The citizen is talking to a woman about her son who is working out in the fields and apparently hasn't been home once. The citizen reassures her that he'll be able to visit that he'll be able to visit in time. Uh do you have any thoughts about his little interaction with the woman? The yeah. son is dead. <laughs> you think he's dead and that's why he's what? making excuses? Don't worry, I'll be there, don't worry. Or he's an alomancer that's under his like, you know but whatever. Hmm. Any thoughts, Mythic? Uh, I mean, not really. Uh, Spook then makes his way over to Beldry, noting she smells faintly of perfume, even though it's supposed to be banned. He illegally, wh- uh, he whispers close to Beldry, asking if she approves of her brother's murders. She spins around, but isn't able to find Spook in the crowd as they're jostled away from each other. After a moment, he makes his way back over to her and says what her brother is doing is the same as what the Lord Ruler did. She spins around again and eventually identifies Spook. She mouths the word, who are you, as she is again separated from him. Spook once again makes his way to her, this time grabbing her hand so they aren't separated. She again asks who he is, and he replies that he is the man who will kill her brother. She doesn't scream or try to run away, just mouths that others have tried to do the same. Spook replies that others are not him, he is the companion of a god, a man who could hear whispers and feel screams, which, god, that's over the top, Spook. <laughs> it really is. It's I a little cringe. A little when I read that shit, bro. <laughs> it's a little cringe, Spook. <laughs> uh, she replies that he is going that's to get... True. <laughs> she replies that he's going against what the people want and that they're always dissenters. Spook then pulls her clothes and tells her that he knew Kelsier and that her brother is perverting his words and that he won't allow that. Uh, what do you think about Beldry? She wasn't she wasn't scared of Spook. She was just she's like, no, I'm gonna talk to this guy. I don't. Yeah, care. She knows, bro. You think she, she knows? knows like what's going on with her brother and everything? Yeah, yeah and I, I also think like, she's an also alamancer. An alamancer, but we're not gonna talk about I, that. Yet. I I have this theory. I have a theory that she's gonna be the first ATM alamancer. Oh, you think she's an ATM Alamancer? Uh-huh. Interesting. They would need ATM for that. I mean, they've been raiding all the houses of all right. the noblemen and kicking them out and killing them. You think they have the stash or something? Oh, I don't think they have the stash, stash, but I feel like... <laughs> I, uh, yeah, maybe. I mean, But I don't think they have the stash. I think they just have, uh, you know... Uh, like, like, probably small ATM from, yeah, like, yeah, the yeah. houses and stuff? Yeah. And she's just gobbling it down <laughs> constantly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if she'd be calling down constantly. She might, she might just like have it ready on her person or something. A little bit of it, just in case. If she, oh, uh, because I was thinking a savant. <laughs> oh, you're thinking she's like a savant. I mean, that you would need a that... fuck ton of ATM. Yeah, you would need the. Yeah, that's what I was fly. like. That's what I was like. What the fuck? <laughs> I thought Mythic said a savant. That's why I was like, oh. No, I think you just said Alamancer. sir. No, I think she's a missing. Yeah, I think she's gonna be our first uh, ATM missing. I just realized. I wonder if the Lord Ruler was a savant of every type of metal. No, I don't think so. No. Is there a savant, like, how do you say it? Like, savant, yeah. E- the equal. E- <sighs> how do you say it? Savant? Oh, like, <laughs> like uh, I think I know what you're getting at. If you think there's, like, a, a savant version of a fair chemist? Yes! Oh my god! You read my mind. <laughs> uh, we don't that's know. how you know there is. We no, only... that's how you know there is. You already knew my question. <laughs> no, I just. Because I, we were talking about she the Lord Ruler. You confirmed it. She did. She did confirm it. Oh, gosh. Uh, so also, what do you think about Spook warning her that is he, he is here to kill her brother and asking what she thinks of her stupid. brother's actions? Isn't that stupid? That was stupid. I mean, yeah, he's, got I he's a little show off. Him, him he's just a crush. telling him. <laughs> yeah, but him just telling her, "Hey, I'm here to kill your brother." Like, okay, so so it's gonna get back to him, and you're. Well, I mean, he tells her, like, you could warn her. I don't care. Yeah, <laughs> but like, then, you know? then five seconds later, he's getting his ass beat. So, <laughs> like, come on, Spook. You, you said yourself, your Tim's not meant for fighting. <laughs> How old is Spook now? Spook, I think, is like nine, like eighteen, nineteen, probably at this point. Uh-huh. 
Okay. He's like a year or two younger than Vin, and I think Vin's supposed to be like 20-ish now. Yeah. I think Vin's like 20 or 21. I think Spook's like 18 or 19. So I think he turned he turned 16 during the first book, and it's been like two to two and a half years or so since. Well, it's been a year since the fucking... Uh... It's been a year since the last book. And then in between the... And then there was all the time of the last book, and then there's also like about a year between the, the first book and the second book, I believe. Or was it two years? It was a year when we first met him because of the fucking getting ready for the overthrowing of the Lord Ruler. Well, yeah, no, but uh, he he was he was I think fifteen, and then he turned sixteen. Because I remember at one point when Vin learns about his crush on her, she's like, "You, he's so much younger than me." And so he's just like, "He's like literally like just sixteen. He's like a year younger than you." She's like, "No, he's Vin like, fifteen. I don't even remember, bro." No, Vin was Vin was sixteen, and then she turns, I believe, seventeen, or she was seven. They're sixteen or seventeen when they start, and she she also uh, ages. Uh, yeah, has her birthday I during. just want an older man. I... <laughs> but yeah, she. But yeah, I think Sage at one point he's like, he's only a year younger than you, and she's like, no, I also just like had my birthday. He's actually two years younger than me. <laughs> okay, but like he's two years like, younger. But like, how is Ellen like? Ellen's I think, so like three older. or four. <laughs> yeah, like. <laughs> but yeah, I I think though like. That's kind Especially, of... I don't know, I feel like when you're a teenager, like, anyone even, like, a year or two younger than you just feels like a child. Like, that's how I felt back when I was in high school. Oh, okay. Age. Okay, but you were the size of a child, so it didn't wow. even matter. Yeah, I was a child, so... Uh, anyways. Uh, so the citizen that notices Spook speaking to Beldre and calls out. Spook dashes away from Beldre, but the streets are packed, and with the high walls of the canal, it makes exits difficult to find. Soldiers rush after him, and Spook pulls out his dueling cane. He thinks that although clubs had made sure Spook knew how to defend himself, he hadn't done much training in the past. Recently, though, he has spent a bit more time training, and in doing so, he had realized that his enhanced tin abilities allowed him to know where people and weapons were by disturbances in the air, tremors in the floor, and the closeness of heartbeats. Uh, Spook dodges a sword as he feels a disturbance in the air, and dodges uh, again when he feels someone There's stepping a disturbance close to his in the force. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Uh, to him, it feels like using ATM. Spook hits one of the men in the back of the head with his dueling cane, and then hits him again in the temple. He then hears a quiet grunt beside him, and he whips his dueling cane around to break the man's arm, causing the man to drop his weapon. Spook also hits him in the head just in case. Then Spook tries to block a third attack, but the man's sword breaks so uh, Spook's dueling cane. It does give Spook time to grab the fallen sword, though. The soldiers circle Spook warily to buy time for more soldiers to arrive and surround Spook, so Spook goes in to attack. But his sword freezes midair. He quickly realizes someone is pushing against his sword with Allomancy, and he looks into the crowd to see Quellian holding onto his sister's shoulder as he focuses on Spook. Uh, so what did you think about, uh, yeah, fucking Allomancer? About, yeah? Quellian. I, 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 have a, I struggle with this uh, name, dude. They're, they're hypocrites, <laughs> right? A bunch of hypocrites. Killing all the other nobles, and he's an Allomancer, mm -hmm. and then we'll find out again in a second, he's also got Allomancers working for him. What did you think, Darkness, when you first learned that uh, he's an Allomancer? I was like, you motherfucker, <laughs> you fucking hypocrite. <laughs> like, oh my god. Let's kill everyone with noble parents, but yeah, either my mom or my dad was also a noble. <laughs> it's usually the dad. In my head, I was that, like, and the people oh, that work for me, yeah. And the people that work for me are also, you know, had noble blood. Probably yeah. like his cousins or something. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just making shit up. I was like, spook, scream it out. <laughs> you know, like, right? I, well, I know, right? I mean, you think people would see that sword flying out? He, I would just scream and shout, "Alamancer!" <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Blast! Crowd to turn on him. Burn him alive, Alamancer! <laughs> so, I have a question. Mm. If but we may have an answer. Mm -hmm. So, ah, uh, fuck. So you know how uh, they can become savants or whatever. Mm -hmm. Does that allow them to like? Con it doesn't, right? To control uh, how much, like, the potency of, like, how much they're pu pushing or pulling on whatever metal? metal? Uh, we don't know anything yet about steel and iron savants. Because yeah. yeah. I was thinking about, we've never got an explanation, right? Where, uh, about how, what's his fucking do it? Yeah. Yeah. The dude with the spike, what's his name? Mm -hmm. Marsh? He has multiple spikes. <laughs> Oh, Zane? Oh, the one, oh, there yeah, you go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, which, which spiked person are you talking about here? <laughs> there's there's a few. Zanon. That Zanon guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we never got an explanation, right? As to, like, how he could, like, ballerina oh, flow down. Yeah, yeah, how it was stronger. Uh, I, I mean, I, mean, he, I think they, they said he had more time to practice, because he'd been uh, Mistborn since he was a so, Okay, so, like, practice just does that? Just uh, a lot. Got it. 
I mean, he could be a savant. He could be just better at controlling it. Because remember, both Kelsey or Kelsey only had about two years without with Alamancy, and then Vin had. I mean, she's had a few more years now, but she originally only had like a year of it through the first book. Besides, like her tiny bits that she used over time. So we don't know if you can just practice well, or if uh, technically you have to be a savant to be super precise. We do not have an answer for that at this moment. Uh, do we ever get an answer to that? Um, no, I believe I know us, the no. answer. I I can't remember though if this is just my assumption though based on other on from my readings or if like it's a legit like written in the text. But I have a feeling I know the pay? answer. Of course not. Of course not. I, I can probably say it. I I I think it might be to a degree of savantism, but to a degree also practice. I think you can get to a certain point where you can control how much you're push or pulling, uh, in order like through practice, but I I think a lot of it would have to be savantism as well to be super, super precise. This isn't a spoiler anyway, because I'm not gonna say character names or anything, but in the second book there is a little part where someone shows off some skill with iron and steel pushing and pulling, and I'm I, I think that person's a savant with it. And they have like an intense control over it. So I, I think there's that's why I think there's a bit. I don't think Zane was a savant, but he could have been. I, there's no confirmation. In the if second, he was or not. wait, you said in the second book? In the second era. Oh, okay. There's a character. That's why I'm not giving names or specifics book. because you guys are not read it and we're not going to read it for a bit. But I, I, I think to a degree it's practice and to a. Obviously, though, savantism would make it more precise. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so Spook then drops his weapon, allowing it to fly out of his hands, and drops to the ground, which allows him to avoid the swing of the soldier's sword. He gets up to avoid the soldier's next attack before dashing under the man's arm before he can swing again. He tries to dash out of the crowd, however, something catches his foot and he sees it's one of the soldiers he knocked down. He quickly notices the man is a thug, because of the fact that he's still conscious after two blows to the head, and also that he's like, how strong he's able to hold onto his foot. Uh, and Spook thinks that the citizen is, isn't as disdainful of nobles as he claims. Uh, more soldiers come, and Spook throws himself at one, grappling him, and then spins around to use the man as a human shield. However, the soldier that goes to attack Spook doesn't seem to care about his friend being in the way, and rams his sword straight through the man's chest and into Spook's chest. Spook realizes this man is also a thug, as the man tries to pull his sword three, free, causing the blade to snap. Spook stumbles backwards as he wonders how he survived this long. At first he doesn't feel pain, but then it hits him, and he blacks out. Uh, were you surprised that at least two of the soldiers were also Alamancers? <laughs> we kind of talked about that already, but... Okay, it's just a hypocrite, that's all. It's just a hypocrite. I expected the one dude and then a soldier to be an Alamancer, and then I was like, fuck, there's a third one? There's, yeah, there's... I mean, who knows what other... If they have other Alamancers, they've got at least yeah. two thugs, so... Yeah, so that was chapter 16. Move on to chapter 17. Uh, mm. The epigraph is, The subtlety displayed in the ash-eating microbes and enhanced plants show that Rashak got better and better at using the power. It burned out in a matter of minutes, but to a god, minutes can pass like hours. During that time, Rashak became as, uh, began as an ignorant child who shoved a planet too close to the sun, grew into an adult who could create ash mounts to cool the air, then finally became a mature artisan who could develop plants for specific purposes. It also shows his mindset during the time with preservation's power. Under its influence, he was obviously in a protective mode. Instead of leveling the ash mounts and trying to push the planet back into place, he was reactive, working furiously to fix the problems he himself had caused. Uh, do you have any thoughts about Rashik's time with preservation's power? I don't remember if we got confirmation. I think we got confirmation before it was preservation's power, right? Did he oh, we know now, so it doesn't even matter. Yeah, yeah I, I just can't remember if we had we'd learned before or not, but we definitely have confirmation. It is preservation's power that was at the well of Ascension, at least in the past. Because mm -hmm. I know you guys have kind of, been like, well, there's two lakes. There's yeah, there's two lakes. Power somewhere. Preservation and ruin could also be, you know, one of the same power. Just, you know, the yin and yang of it. Mm. That's what I was thinking of. Because mm -hmm. of that yeah. one. What is it? Uh, what were you saying, Darkness? Because uh, of that one epigraph, the one where, where there's, I think it was an epigraph, I don't remember, but but they were like, oh, without mm. preservation, like, you know, it's like with, <laughs> without light, there is no darkness. Yeah, 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 <laughs> without preservation, there is no ruin, without ruin, there's no preservation, yeah. Uh, I think, I think that's why Ruin's throwing a little tantrum, he misses his bestie. <laughs> he missed that now, okay, or he just wants to take over the body in complete full, you know? No, 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 no. 
It's like, I got trapped Preser here for so long. I'm pissed at you. We're having a fight. <laughs> no, no, no. Preservation's body is the mist, and he's trying to go back to get a uh, fucking ruins body so they can, like, have little babies together. Oh, okay. <laughs> and live a happily ever life. Okay. You know. All right. Uh... They're, the, they're the queer lovers we've been waiting for. All right, we're gonna... Um, not in this book. <laughs> uh, so we get Ellen's point of view. <laughs> we're gonna move on. We get Ellen's point of view as he rides on a white stallion in front of his nervous army as they get ready for yeah, the Yeah, this white knight. God damn. Demo was riding next to him, also on a stallion. Ellen thinks about how he's not allowing himself to be worried as he knows he is too honest and it will show on his face to his soldiers if he allows himself to worry. Instead, he keeps his worries for when he's alone or only with the people closest to him, such as Vin. The captains shout for the men to be ready, and Ellen notes that they have decided to wear their armor like they were going into battle, which Ellen thinks that in a way they are. Ellen knows that the men trust him, and their trust makes him determined. He shouts with pewter enhanced strength for the men to be strong. He tells them that some will be struck down by the mists, but that most will be fine, and even most who fall to the mists will survive it. He says that when they go to Fadrix, they could be attacked when the mists are still out, and if they don't do this, then they will have a six of their men shaking on the ground during the fight. He tells the men that he doesn't know why the mists kill, but that if they do die, it is because of the will of the Lord of the Mists, the survivor. Uh, what did you think of Ellen's speech to the soldiers? Sounds like <laughs> Kelsier, uh, Kelsier's speech to the soldiers the first time. Oh no. Why oh no? Oh, he's, kind of, he's killing them with hope, you know? No, it's because in my head I was like, I would have gone to battle just because of that, you know? <laughs> He, 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 um, if someone spoke to me like that, I would have been falling head over heels. <laughs> uh, so Demo then tells Ellen it was a good speech, but asks if he meant what he said about the survivor. Ellen replies that he did, and when Demo questions his faith, he replies that he keep, he's kept his word. Demo again questions this, as he says that if Ellen doesn't truly believe in the survivor, then he shouldn't speak in his name. Ellen replies that he doesn't believe in the Lord Ruler or saves old gods, and he thinks having faith in the survivor is better than the alternatives. He also says he'd rather believe that something is helping them with all of this uh, that is coming in the next few months. Uh, Demo then says Kelsier became more than a man and that he gained something eternal and immortal. He also mentions that it's odd Kelsier snapped at the pits when he must have gone through beatings and hardships before then. Demo says that Kelsier the man died at the pits, but Kelsier the survivor was born and he was granted great powers. He had the follies of a man, but the hopes of a divinity. Uh, do you think it's true that Kelsier didn't truly snap at the pits, but instead someone, something else gave him powers? Or do you think he Well, yeah, especially after what we get a little bit later. I was like, I wasn't, th I was like, oh no, that's definitely where he snapped, and then later, fucking, ugh. I was like, oh, now I got another theory. Uh, what do you think, Darkness? Do you think that he snapped at the pits, or is Demo right in that, uh, there was something more divine going on? He snapped at the pits, but this whole time, Loki, I've been thinking, what if, like, Believe you remember when I was like, what if they made the gods gods by like you know believing in them or whatever? And that mm. fucking when Says was uh talking about religion and discussing all of those. So I feel like I feel like I've said this before, but I feel like Kelsier, you know, kind of achieved that. Mm. And if anything, he would be like a baby god, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you think he's becoming a god because of the people believing in him, and like that somehow like making him into an actual god. Mm-hmm. Because if you're a god, you gotta have worshippers. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're dying out. Uh, so Ellen finds that the scholar part of his brain knows that Kelsier is just being slowly made into a god, which is why these sorts of things are starting to be said and believed. However, he does wonder how Kelsier didn't snap before going to the pits. Then people begin to scream as the mists arrive. Men begin to collapse, and other men shake in fear. Ellen turns to Demo as he feels the need to go comfort the men, but he sees Demo shaking in his seat and then falling off his horse to the ground. Ellen calls out Demo's name in shock, having thought he was already immune to the mists. Ellen gets off his horse and kneels next to Demo as his friend shakes while Ash continues to fall. Were you surprised that Demo hadn't been out in the mist since Ruin was released? Yes, because I thought he would have been, like, you know, up on the battlefield doing everything with everyone, but also... Apparently he's been a coward. You know what I realized? <laughs> I don't know if a white horse would be the go for Ellen. <laughs> You don't like the white horse with Ellen? <laughs> if anything, wouldn't it like just make him blend in with his fucking horse? <laughs> uh, hmm. Looks like a chess piece, it's fine. I'd say I'd say a black horse to clash with colors, but okay. It just looks like he's floating because of all the ash around. <laughs> exactly! A god, bruh! <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you think, Mythic? Were you surprised that Demo uh, had never been out in the mist since Ruin was released? I think, I, I don't know if I was exactly su su uh, surprised, it was more that I was worried about him, because I liked him, though. 
Yeah. Dynamo. Mm-hmm. We do get to find I out did, that like, he does I survive, did luckily. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, repeat it? I was, I was just saying, we do we do get to find out uh, that he does survive. And then on uh, like two chapters or something. Yay, Demo. He does not die. <laughs> yeah, he's not one of the, what, 14% or some shit? You know. uh, oh, no, he is a 14%. He's a 14%. He's, he's part of the 16%. 16, 16%. He's part of the 16%. He's not part of the lesser that uh, die because of it, die. which doesn't, which we'll talk about more, but it doesn't seem to have a particular percentage to that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that was chapter 17. Chapter 18's epigraph is Rashak didn't solve all the world's problems. In fact, with each thing he did fix, he created new issues. However, he was clever enough Ooh. that each subsequent problem was smaller than the ones before it. So instead of plants that died from the distorted sun and ashy ground, we got plants that didn't provide quite enough nutrition. He did save the world. True, the near destruction was his fault in the first place, but he did an admirable job, all things considered. At least he didn't release ruin to the world as we did. Uh, so do you agree that what Finn did was worse than what Rashek did? I was laughing my ass off when I read that shit because he was like, at least he's not Finn. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he says we. Whoever, no, no, whoever no. the hero of ages is. He knows damn well he didn't do shit to fucking <laughs> release him, so. I don't know why you keep saying whoever. We already know. There is no confirmation yet. <laughs> I literally, I'm like him. He, he no, you do. <laughs> I've also <laughs> just fallen into doing that as well because, <laughs> like, but it's just like it's, it's sazed. It's sazed. I'm like, okay. We already know. know. He like. I'm not even talking about just the listening to the audiobook. The fucking words the he, he talks, uses speaks, are exactly yeah. how he talks. He's also very annoying, so it makes sense. Wow. No. It's not annoying. Says is like awesome. Says is great. Just because you like Says doesn't mean he's not fucking annoying. He's not annoying. He's a great guy. Yeah, just like Spook's not annoying. He's just he's a annoying great as guy. Spook too, but... <sighs> Spook's cringe. Spook, Spook just reminds me of cringe teenagers. I, I have I have, I have I struggle to read them because I'm like, oh god. Yeah, wait, you have a you have a. Cringe it reminds teenager? you of I know. You? I, like I've been a cringe teenager. He reminds me of so cringe you, teenagers. So, so he reminds you of you. You hate I yourself. Yeah, I hate my teenage self. I was so cringe what? in high school. Oh, but you hate... I mean, you're still cringe, though. Wow, I'm less cringe. I'm not as cringe I can imagine now. Nick walking into class being like, I am the friend of God! <laughs> God, no, I didn't do that. <laughs> I, hear the, I hear the screams of dead people. Oh, God. <laughs> I will stab you in the face. Oh, wait. <laughs> anyway, It doesn't, doesn't matter if you tell your brother, I'm gonna kill him anyways, even though I'm only a ten-eye. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been staring at you at a window for like months or something, just watching was you looking creepily at, at a window. <laughs> that part you could have kept out, I right? cringe lord. I. Right. Hmm. I said that part you could have kept out, cringe lord. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we move to Say's point of view as he releases the final horse that he, Breeze, and the guards uh, have with them. It was too malnourished to keep carrying anyone, and they could no longer spare food for it. Breeze asks if the horse will survive, and Say says it might nope. be able to, but it will be difficult. Reason asks if Sazed might be able to eat through the ash. Yeah, they're like, he might be able to eat some plants, kind of. It's it's not going to work. Be easy. Uh, so Reason asks if Sazed will join him and Alrian in the carriage, which had wooden panels removed to lighten it so the men can pull it. Sazed thinks that he would feel too guilty, so he tells Breeze he will walk. Reason goes back to the carriage to sit with Alrian. Sazed tells Captain Gorodel to continue the march. He notes that marching in the thick ash is like walking on sand as it shifts under your feet. Sace also thinks about how Vin had told him that she had accepted Ellen's death back at the well because of what he had taught her. He holds the picture of the flower in his sleeve and wonders why people come to him for advice, as he feels like a hypocrite as he doesn't take his own advice. He feels sick at making decisions, and his thoughts are constantly invaded by doubts. He thinks that religion is to help people get through times like these. So Sace glances down at his portfolio of religions that he has already shifted through. He thinks that the crew struggles with the survivor religion because they knew Kelsier too well and knew his faults, and that his own struggles with these religions are the same. He knows them too well, and thus he can see their faults easily. He thinks that divinity has to be perfect. There can't be flaws or contradictions. So he's just sure that he will find one religion that will provide him with the answers. Thus, he takes one out, uh, takes out one of the religions he hasn't deemed wrong yet, and straps it to the front of the portfolio to study it, study it as he walks. Sace thinks that he isn't sure what he'll do if none of the religions have answers for him. Uh, do you think there will be a religion that has the answer Sace wants? Kelsey's religion, I'm sorry. Mm, I mean, there's there's so many religions. Probably. Probably be something. Uh, so we skip ahead to the group reaching the central dominance. Sazed had kept walking even though it made it difficult to study his religions. 
He notes the cultivated farmlands of the area as Ellen had packed as many people into the central dominance as possible and made them start working on growing as much food as possible before the winter. Sayce notes that agriculture was difficult due to having to clear out all the ash that falls during the night, as well as not all the farmland being irrigated and thus having to carry water to the fields. Sayce finds himself feeling hopeless, looking at the brown plants that are growing and look small and weak next to the mounds of ash. Captain Gordel comes over, though, and says the fields and the people working them give him hope. He mentions that his family had been farmers, although he had become a soldier, not because farming was hard work, but because of how hopeless the farmers seemed. He also corrects Sayce about how he joined the group, how he helped Ellen go to save Vin, although he didn't think she really needed much help. Gordel then says the farmers seem happy and that they're working because they want to, not because they'll be beaten. Sayce notes the farmers look up and wave as they see Ellen's banner. He replies that the farmers are working because they'll starve. But Gordel says that working to keep their families alive, and not just because they have to, is different. Uh, so what do you think about Captain Gordel's view of the farmers? Pretty accurate. Not gonna lie, I didn't really care about that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I was like, I... okay. <laughs> you know, like, that's happening. Alright. <laughs> uh, so Captain Gordel then says he thinks that they should stop in Luthadel for supplies. Sage replies that he had expected that, but he'll leave Breeze in charge and meet back up with them just north of Luthadel, as he has something he needs to do while they restock. Gordel just nods as he goes to make arrangements, not asking what uh, Sage what he needs to do. Because skip... he wouldn't tell you anyways. <laughs> we then skip several days forward to Sage arriving at the Pits of Hatson, which is now home to the Terrace people. There are around 40,000 of them left, and most of them are eunuchs like Sage. Although the pits could no longer be mined due to Kelsier's damage to them, the buildings and infrastructure around the pits remained, and thus were a good place for the terrace people to settle, and they'd even expanded the area with more buildings. You can see the terrace people sweeping away ash so that their short-legged breed of sheep could graze on the hardy plants below. Sace thinks that the terrace people are living an easier life than most, which is strange to consider. Uh, so what did you think about the terrace people making their home at the pits of Hassan? Probably a good, uh, probably a good place for them to be at. Like, with the... Uh... Like rumors and everything about it, like the it's past history, so mm. nobody's nobody's gonna come fuck with them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there might be somebody. Watch them find like ATM, and then we find out what it, what it does and stuff. What do you mean you'll find out what it does for like for Kimmy? It, it makes them younger, remember? Oh, it does, right? <laughs> we, we already know what ATM does with Fair Kimmy. Look, I can't remember shit. <laughs> Alright, so Sace uh, soon brought attention from the children and sheep as they come up to him. Several older men also rush up to him, still wearing their steward robes like Sace does. The men call him Lord Sazed and Your Majesty, and he tells them not to call him that. So instead they call him Master Keeper and say they want him to get oh, some warm food. I fucking cringed when they said Your Majesty. Like, <laughs> Your the Majesty. He's like, please don't. <laughs> just, just please don't. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so then we move on to chapter 19's epigraph. And says, yet the ash was black. No, it should not have been. Most common ash has dark components, but it's just as much gray or white as it is black. Ash from the ash mounts, it was different. Like the mists themselves, the ash covering our land was not truly a natural thing. Perhaps it was the influence of ruin's power, as black as preservation was white. Or perhaps it was simply the nature of the ash mounts, which was designed and created specifically to blast ash and smoke into the sky. So what do you think about Ruin being black and Preservation being white? And why do you think they have a color assigned to them? The mist. Yeah. <laughs> the, the like, I, I, I mean, like, I mean, he said it. It's exactly what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. The mist. Do you think the, the color association then is because of the, the way they're, like, the, the misty forms of them come about? Or do you think there's any other reasons? That they're kind of like, the, like this color. Yeah, black is the seen perception as evil. On it. White is, like, yeah, yeah, and white is seen as good. Even though I'd find, I'd do, I would find it extremely funny if that was uh, reversed. <laughs> yeah. Any other thoughts about that epigraph, or should I move on? Nope. Uh, we go back to Spook's point of view, as he's woken by someone shouting at him to get up. The world feels get muted. up! <laughs> the world feels muted, and he feels numb. Then a clear voice again tells him to get up, using his nickname. Spook notes that his spectacles and cloth are gone, and that he is out of tin, which is why the world feels so dull and dead to him. Spook notes that he is in a room and sits up, quickly feeling a pain in his shoulder from his untreated wound, and noting that his left arm isn't working well. The voice tells him that he's lost a lot of blood, and that the flames may get him. It also tells him that they took his pouch of tin dust. Spook asks about the flames, and the voice says, asks if he feels them, which he does notice a light after a moment. He then realizes he's in a nobleman's house and he, that is being burnt down. 
Spook tries to stand, but immediately falls back down, and the voice tells him to crawl. Spook feels like he's heard the voice before and trusts it. So, when you were first reading this, Wonder what why. did you think yeah, of the voice? I, as, soon as, he said that, as soon as he said that, I was like, this is Kelsey's voice. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, no, there's no way it's not. And then that, that just made me think, okay, well, you know, the voices that are in heads, who else has voices that are in heads? And, oh, man, maybe uh, the one was ruined, so maybe Kelsey is a god! <laughs> uh, so Spook begins to Got crawl. <laughs> Spook begins to crawl, but the voice tells him not to go toward the flames. He asks about a window, but the voice tells him their board is shut, and if he wants to survive, he needs to follow the voice's instructions. The voice tells him to crawl towards the stairs, leading to the second floor. Spook goes up to the second floor, but soon slumps against the wall. However, the voice insists he gets up and go to the second room on the left. He makes his way into the room, which is a study, and thinks about how lavish the room is, as the thieves don't even want to steal the things that seem too lavish and noble. He also remembers Dern mentioning the, to count the skulls, which, yeah, nothing else. He, he's just like, oh yeah, I remember this, and nothing about that afterwards. Uh, oh, the... That's right, when he said it, you know, when he said it, it was pretty late, you know, and I was like, okay, like, what do you do with that? <laughs> Count the skulls! Come on! <laughs> just count them! Uh, so the voice shouts Spook's name and tells him to go to the desk and that he's not dead. Spook lifts up to see a dark figure standing, seemingly unbothered by the flames and smoke. The figure seems familiar, tall, and commanding. What were your first thoughts when you saw this figure? Kelsey? Yes, we, we learned it's Kelsey, but you haven't learned that yet. Like, when, when you were first reading it. Okay, but like, I knew from the beginning, okay, right? You, okay, yeah. You both saw That's it from what the I was beginning. Say, it's okay. Kelsey, yeah. Uh, so Spook then goes to the desk and opens up one of the drawers to reveal vials of elementic metals and alcohol solution. He tries to pick one up, but drops it, causing it to shatter. He then picks up a second and drinks it, but finds no source of tin within him. The voice shouts for Spook to burn the metal, a metal other than tin. Spook is surprised that he can feel a different metal reserve within him. Spook burns pewter, growing stronger and less dizzy. The figure then tells Spook that it gave him the blessing of pewter, and to use it to escape- Gave him the blessing of pewter! Yes. I gave them the blessing of this as a conjurer. I gave them the blessing of. Oh my I was going to bring that up. I was uh -huh. going to be like, did you catch the, the blessing? But to be fair, mm. as he said it, he got stabbed. So they, like, no. No, so it, it started opening up a whole thing, even though the next. I think it's the next one where we get. Uh, what is the conjurer's point of view? Yeah, um, we get the conjurer's point of view next. Uh, let me. We, we, I have like two Go paragraphs on. left to read on this, and then we can discuss more about Spook here if you want. Let me mm -hmm. just quickly finish like, up my little... The god. Yep, Spook the god. Got it. Uh, so yeah, he feels a different metal reserve within him. Spook burns pewter, growing stronger and less dizzy. The figure then tells Spook that it gave him the blessing of pewter and to use it to escape by tearing off some wooden boards and going out onto the roof of a nearby building where the guards won't be watching. Spook thanks the figure and then properly sees the man's face. There was a reason he had trusted the voice. He'd do whatever this man commanded. Kelsier tells Spook that he didn't give him Pewter just to survive, but to get revenge. Uh, so first of all, do you think this figure was actually Kelsier? Yes. In, in like, a different form, like, you know. A godly form? Yeah, like, like yeah. Like, I still think Kelsier's dead, I just think he's gonna come back. Mm. Kind of like Ruin came back, you know. Uh, also, do you think Spook is now a Mistborn, or does he somehow just have two uh, elementic? He abilities? just has two. He definitely just has to. He has a blessing. That's what he, he has. He has a blessing too. So, you, so you're saying he's he's, he's just tin and pewter. He doesn't have the others. I hope he has all of them. I want him to be an element. Uh, no, uh, Mistborn. <laughs> yeah, an alamancer. I want him to be an alamancer. He is an alamancer. I, I want him to be. A, <laughs> he's a double alamancer now. <laughs> uh, at the current moment, until he eats other things and then be shown he's a mistborn. I mean, um, I I. Pretty, if I, I want him to be a mistborn because he stated, I remember in the very, I think it was the first book, about that he was like envious of uh, Vin and Kelsier being mistborns because mm -hmm. he wishes he could do it. Because all he had was tin. All he's got is tin. He doesn't feel like tin's very useful. No, oh, it is. Uh, and so my final question for that little section was how do you think Kelsier was able to give Spook the blessing of pewter? Because he's a god! I don't think he did. You don't think he did? What do you think happened then? Hemallergy? You think it was hemallergy? Yeah, he literally got stabbed through somebody who had Peter, right? We don't know which hey, person he grappled, but it might have been the thug. So, oh, I'm pretty sure he, they stated okay. there was two thugs, right? There's two thugs, yes. Yeah, one so one of them had... got stabbed through, and then it went through him, and then he absorbed his power because hemallergy, and he woke up, and he's, like, getting, like, that fucking 
uh, voice channeling through his head because, you know, that's how they fucking do it with the fucking spikes, apparently, because <laughs> apparently Zane was able to hear it and he had the spike through him, too. So, mm. like, you know, yeah, maybe that's stuff is happening channel, with yeah, Hemolurgy yeah. there. Mm. Yeah, and that's why much. it's pewter, because, like, it was a yeah, thug, that's so. Uh-huh. That's a good theory. I didn't even think of that. A book theory. <laughs> Hey, don't be stealing my line, right? <laughs> Pretty sure I started that line. You started saying game no, theory. No, you did like, not. You no, started you saying didn't. game theory, and I said, no, it's a no. book theory from the first book. That's only a theory. A game theory. Yeah, and then I said, no, it's a book theory. And then you <laughs> s- you have used book theory since then. My line. My line. <laughs> I started yeah. it. It's my line. <laughs> we obviously know what's happening, you know? Uh, possibly, yeah. Uh-huh. I, I didn't even think about that. That's a good, that's a good catch there. Uh... Yeah, the, the sword hmm. member did snap. Mm-hmm. The tip in him. His wound has been untreated. <laughs> Just the tip. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, if that's if that's if, like, would they have? I guess so. They I guess so they didn't pull the sword out. Is what? They're saying? Well, remember the the thug tried to pull the sword out and it snapped. The blade snapped. Well, it was still yeah. inside Spook. So it's just a spike, is what I'm saying, Lee. I gotcha, yeah. So it, it ends up becoming a spike. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and it would make even more sense if, it, with my god theory of uh, Kelser being a god that he wouldn't let it come out, you know? It was stuck in him. Mm. He's like, no, 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 Spook, you need this. Yeah, it's you'll okay. need this later, so. <laughs> you know, I'm, 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 I'm omnipotent here. No, omnipresent. The, the question that I have would be like, does he now just have to scary, uh, carry that fucking spike inside yeah. of him the whole time? Uh, if, if yeah, if your theory is correct, he if he gets rid of that spike, he no longer has pewter powers. So get all the powers. <gasps> that's what I was gonna think that would happen. I mean, I was thinking I mean, that it, he would it just goes like on the, yeah. mm-hmm, he go would on. figure it out, and that he would be like, "Fuck it, let me turn into a mistborn and just stab himself." With yeah, I'll be a mistborn people. now. But you have to stab through somebody who has the missing power, though. He's gonna try and replicate it. There's no fucking way he doesn't. And we still got Kelly Quelly on. Who gives a fuck about Kelly? Him? <laughs> Quelly. Yeah. I mean, what, what, his, what, was, what was his power? He's got. Uh, I mean, we don't know for sure. He's he can at least push metals. He either has steel or iron. Yeah. I keep forgetting which one. Oh is my god! If he's a mistborn, if he's a mistborn, he could be a mistborn for all you He know. was gonna be a mistborn, Loki. <laughs> yeah. If he's a mistborn. Then you don't need. Then he just stabs through a mistborn, and he'll be. <laughs> he'll be a mistborn. Right? That's how power works. Uh, I wonder if that is how it works. I wonder what uh, happens if you stab a Mistborn after already have stabbing a Mistborn. Uh, you will learn about what ha- about what happens if you stab through a Mistborn. Mm-hmm. They're stabbing okay. a Mistborn. If, if if you take the powers, if they using Hemolurgy, if you take from a Mistborn. No, that's what I mean. But like, what if you already stabbed the Mistborn, right? Take the power and you do it again. Like, I mean, I feel like they have to be dead. I think he means like a second Mistborn. Yeah. Oh. He means you you, you you kill a misborn to make a hemolytic spike, and then you kill another misborn yeah. to make a hemolytic spike. Like, will that just double the power double you have, misborn. or like double your misborn powers? Stronger. I cannot speak on anything just yet. Stronger, stronger. Oh, so it does. Okay. I will let you will find out whether that is a possible. She's like, now misborns later. explode. Bro. We're moving on to chapter twenty. <laughs> uh, the epigraph is more than one person reported feeling a sentient hatred in the mist. This is not necessarily related to the mist killing people, however. For most, even those it struck down, the mist seemed merely a weather phenomenon, no more sentient or vengeful than a terrible disease. For some few, however, there was more. Those it favored, it swirled around. Those it was hostile to, it pulled away from. Some felt peace within it, others felt hatred. It all came down to Mm -hmm. Bruin's subtle touch and how much one responded to his promptings. So, what do you think it means... What do you think the, it, this all means regarding the mist swirling around Finn as she killed Rashek, but pulling away from her on her way to the Well of Ascension? And what do you like, think you ruins t- the, the epigraph or my question? Yeah, the epigraph. Uh, so more than Quickly. one person has reported feeling a sentient hatred in the mist. This is not necessarily related to the mist killing people, however. For most, even those that struck down, the mist seemed merely a weather phenomenon, no more sentient or vengeful than a terrible disease. Uh, for some few, however, there was more. Those it favored, it swirled around. Those it was hostile to, it pulled away from. Some felt peace within it, others felt hatred. It all came down to Ruin's subtle touch and how much one responded to his promptings. That's what answered my question. Mm-hmm. The question. Yeah, it was his epigraph. I had forgotten about this epigraph because I write the epigraphs in advance and then do the chapter notes, so that's why I wasn't remembering it. That's what I was struggling to fucking yeah, say. Sorry, but... <laughs> sorry I, as I said, I write, I write the epigraphs in advance. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously... I don't know if Darkness, uh, Darkness, you have a theory here before I go on. Uh, I did, but you see, my brain is scrambled right now, so you're going to have to do it for me. 
<laughs> brain is first. scrambled. Apparently, because I'm not functioning. Like, he was up all night partying. Oh my god. <laughs> wait, wait, was it a Spanish party? Yeah, of course. Oh yeah, fuck yeah. You're, you're, definitely, you're, you're definitely out. You're down. I'm surprised you're even here, to be honest. That's, that's why he only woke up like half an hour before the podcast started. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, but no, uh, obviously, like, because... Because before she was pretty much being backed by preservation to take out Reshek, uh, so the, it would like you know swirled around her, and then now that she's released Ruin, and I feel like she's probably going down that path of like in some way unintentionally uh, assisting Ruin. Mm. The mist is trying to basically tell her that you know you're becoming you're my enemy now, you know, so it's mm. backing off from her. Oh, it only has so much of a voice, okay. Kind of an airhead, after all. <laughs> wow. You want to try responding, Darkness, or your, is your brain too scrambled? Um, Scrambled eggs. I feel like maybe it's backwards. You think it's the other way around? That the mist swirl around you when Ruin likes you? And pull away if Ruin doesn't? And I feel like the only reason it was attracted to it in the beginning was because it was trying to make Ruin release it. Awesome. Which, I mean, like, I feel like... At that point, Ruin and Preservation both have, like, a little war going on in the fucking mist or something, because, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, the only reason I could think of Preservation not liking Vin is because she released Ruin. Mm-hmm. So, that's, yeah, that's a good idea, too, to be honest. I actually didn't think about that. Holy shit. Mm-hmm. Are you being attacked? Are you being attacked, Darkness? Uh, if you were hearing the call, that was me. That was Midnight. Oh, it was Midnight? <laughs> oh, Midnight's being attacked. Oh. No, the cops are going by. I'm on the, I'm on you the just street. Doof, 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 FBI. <laughs> we don't oh have the FBI. The FBI, FBI is a US up. thing. Oh, you don't? No, what? We don't, a, we don't have the FBI. The FBI is a USA. Uh, what do you have? I'm here, eh? Uh, I mean, we have the RCMP. What the fuck is that? RCMP. Royal Canadian Mounted, please. Hey. Are you fucking kidding me? Yes. Uh-huh. That's... That sounds like they're like... He'll be on the, no, you know, they're, 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 they wear the cool red uniforms. They're, they're, they're horse, they're horsebound officers. They, they, they only do horses now for ceremony. They're horse. I was gonna say officers. they only do horses now, general. No, they, no, the, do, the, the, wait, the horse they do the horses. No, wait, are they trying to no, make centaurs? No. <laughs> no. Oh no! <laughs> no. no! Don't say that. Oh my god, it's gonna be the centaur police. Oh my gosh! Here, darkness. I'll send you a picture of the RCMP. During a ceremony when they're on horseback. Oh, is this a ceremony when they're always on horseback? Yeah. I, yeah, I don't think they. I don't think they do horses any. I keep saying it that way, and me <laughs> now I'm gonna be all fucked up. Uh, they don't. I don't think they ride horses except during ceremony anymore. They def. They definitely ride horses all the time. That's all they do. That's why they get you know outran all the time. That's why they're terrible. Why do they all? Why do all the horses look the same? Because they're horses. That's not how it works. I don't know. It's the same breed of horse. They get like I guess like a certain breed of horse. It would oh. still. That looks kind of weird. What do you mean? CMP, open up. Yeah, that would be what happens. RCMP, open the door. Is that who you call if like? <laughs> uh, so we have like... a police, and then we also have the RCMP. Yeah, yeah, they have right a. Eh? Have the police a. Eh? The FBI looks better. Anyway. No. CMP, eh? Open up, eh? Do you have, like, a fucking, uh, what's it called? A SWAT team? <laughs> um, I, maybe? I just don't know what they would be I called. I mean, they're, they're, they're uh, Can- Canada is very, like, ho- you know, not hostile, so, you know, <laughs> All the people are imagine, way like, too nice. I can snowmen going down the fucking rope. <laughs> All the, all the people in Canada are way too nice, you know. When I look up Canadian SWAT team, it just says it falls under the RCMP as well. Huh? Are you kidding me? It's just the RCMP, dude. P the RCMP. How do you not know how your thing like works? Because right? people don't get swatted care. here. <laughs> I've never heard of anyone getting swatted in Canada. Like, uh, well, I, I guess I gotta change that real quick. No. Swat you it's right. Just, now. We're coming for you, Canada. Oh, God. <laughs> Anyways, can we move on? Let's, no. Let's go back to. Uh, let's go back to the book. Yeah. All right. Finish the epigraph. Now what? We, we've done What's the epigraph. Do you guys have anything else to say about let's it? Or finish the epigraph. Now what? Uh, we switched to Tensoon's point of view. It's a Tensoon chapter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As si- wow. As he sits in his cage, the cage was an insult as he w- wouldn't try to escape like a man would. Condra accepted their fate and he had come willingly. The cage was two iron plates with steel bars 
and it also had a strong wire mesh wrapped around it so that he couldn't squeeze his body through the bars, which is also an insult. The cage was in the middle of one of the main caverns, and Tensun is sitting in it naked. He wonders if, if his words in the trust warren had been of any value. I mean, Some... I mean would, would he be naked, though? Like They don't give him clothes. He, he's got but, that like, no, naked no, but what I'm saying is, like, they're always clothesless. So like, well, no, some of them had robes though. Remember that, but they were open, so you could still see their, their bones. They're, they're junk, I, th- yeah. I think he, I think he's more saying, I think he's more referring to naked as in like he's hu- he's got a human body that's naked, although he got rid of the genitals. But, um, I, I don't think they really refer to their. Hmm? I said that does that mean does that mean he's actually naked? Because if he removed the genitals, it's just a naked just means you don't you're not wearing clothing. No, I mean naked means it can mean a lot of things in all, in all honesty, like you know. People are naked, you know. The uh, definition of naked is completely unclothed. He wonders if his words in the trust warrant had been of any value. Some conjure stop and glance at him as they go about their duties, and Tensoon thinks that this is the reason the seconds had chosen to wait to give him a sentence. They were displaying him in a way that no other conjure had been, and he thinks that his name will be a word of shame for centuries. Tensoon thinks that the point of his speech was that they wouldn't last centuries, but he isn't sure if he's if he gave his speech well. Uh, so what do you think about them, like, Basically, like, showing Tensoon off in this cage. You know what I realized? Mm. He's probably ugly as fuck. Well, apparently ugly he thought fuck. he was going to be, but apparently the... the Remember when he he transformed, the Condor was like, oh, you must have used these bones before, because it looks like a normal person. Well, didn't he say that he had, like, ugly ass skin or some shit? He, he said Not that... Not exactly. He, he said usually... I think he, he kind of implies that, like, when you transform without having something to replicate, it was... He's like, oh, I can replicate a person but they're probably grotesque but like i don't think he gets to look in a mirror those yeah. only good for those the privileged ones you know we don't we don't know how handsome or ugly he looks at the moment oh uh, he must be real handsome because his girlfriend comes up to the bar so <laughs> yeah what, what did you guys think about Tenzu being shown off though like this the seconds kind of like being like look at this criminal here is my pet look at I them mean, in my the own Tenzu like that bro. oh my gosh right. in a cage just hanging from the ceiling <laughs> from the ceiling. Gosh. A little cage, you know. Uh, Tenzin then wonders if Vin made it to the Well of Ascension and wonders about ruin and preservation. He thinks of them as the Chondra gods and thinks that they were they are at war again. And that the you know, wars... wait, real quick mm-hmm. uh, on that topic. This they, he obviously knew about ruin and preservation beforehand. Yes. Don't you think if he would have just said, "Hey, Vin, there are these two gods," okay? And one of them is, you know, pretty evil. She could have maybe been prepared for this shit? He already <laughs> spilled enough. He, I mean, no! He, <laughs> he doesn't spill enough at all! I, he kind of tells her. He's like, we are of preservation. You are of ruin. And she's like, oh, religion shit, whatever. <laughs> like, he, he probably I should be a bit like more clear knew. that no, these are real forces. And not just yeah. like some random religion. But no, yeah. He, he kind of told her, but not really. I mean, I just think the whole secrecy thing is so dumb. Like, I understand you're trying to be secret because, oh, they might kill us and blah, blah, blah. But, like, in all honesty, you you have a lot of more power in this scenario than they believe, you know, than they really do. Like, Sounds like all of the Conjure know a lot about these gods as well. Uh, okay, like... but I don't, think, I don't think it's something they really care to fucking stop considering, like, it's their gods and they don't seem to be, like, Worried, so they're not worried that ruin might destroy the world. I mean, yeah, Tenzin okay. seems worried. They have they. I, he, yeah. he, in his speech, he was like, "This is happening. We need to be prepared." I think he says like he, he has like a word for it. what the fuck. He was talking about it in his resolution. speech. Resolution. Yeah, the day of resolution or something was coming. He said. I mean, he also did say that uh, the conjurer would be around after the uh, humans are extinct. So. Mm-hmm. Just like why I'm like they're not looking like worried but whatever i guess maybe um I feel like if you're of preservation and you know shit that that's the thing though i don't think they're solely of preservation you think, they're I partially think he lied right? you think he's lying you think they just like to think of themselves as pres- of preservation but they're not yeah like, they're like no no or we're maybe the good he was guys. specifically <laughs> talking about like himself i think he says when he's talking to him about it, he specifically says the chondra are preservation and the humans uh, are of ruin I'm still waiting well, until we get to the blessing thing. It's because the thing that's bothering me is that he's saying, like, our gods, you know? like mm-hmm. Yeah. Onwards and upwards. Uh, so Tenzin then notices that some Eleventh are moving around, just blobs with some bones in them. 
He thinks that when a Mithras is given blessings and gains sentience, it loses its instincts and must relearn how to form a body. This process apparently took many years, and he also notes that some Chandra are going around, uh, about food preparation, which is a stew of algae and fungi, and that the aged meat he eats when doing a contract is a tempting consolation. <laughs> uh, so any thoughts on the formation of new Chandra? I kind of think we already touched on the fact that that's what we thought it was going to be, but I, like I said, I think they have like a nail or metal piece or whatever. They have metal rods, are the blessings. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so then that means that, like, you know, obviously hemallergy and all that shit, so. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, I found that a lot more uh, concerning later when she, she comes up to him and she's like, I don't know why he doesn't have a uh, aura surge blessing. I was like, wait, what? You can take a blessing? Yeah, I was, I was like, what the fuck? Yeah, we'll get to that. Huh. <laughs> In all honesty, that 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 leads me to a whole bunch of other stupid shit that fucking uh, spooks can then do, you know? Oh, hey, let me I, go fight a fucking Steel Inquisitor and take all the I was gonna say, what if, like, what if, like, uh, what's his name? Marsh? No. Uh, Tensun? Tensun. Tensun. <laughs> what if Tensun could just, like, eat a Steel Inquisitor? <laughs> he probably could, but I don't know if it would work the same way. Well, he would get, like, all the spikes, right? Well, I mean, like, I don't know if they're the same, it's the same idea, though, you know? Yeah, it depends if all the spikes are the same, because the Inquisitors specifically have, like, these nail-type things. Large nails. Uh, the... well, I feel like it's just uh, a way, like, a, uh, the object they they chose to use. Like, obviously, if Sp if it's if we're right, and Spook's uh, little, like, knife wound or whatever. Able to get it just whatever. from, like, the sword. Too. Yeah, yeah, then it, it probably has to be a metal object embedded in a bo in a piece of, you know, in, in part of your body. And so, like, it was more of, like, a cosmetic thing for the Inquisitors. Let's just put spikes in their head. You know, probably or also nails was, in their body. It's probably mm -hmm. also because it's easy to shove a spike, easier to shove a spike through someone. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like it'd be easier to shove a sword through somebody, but, you know. I mean, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a cleaner, easier you know, wound to deal with. <laughs> so we'll never, we'll, we'll never get to see it. I'm sure, but it would be so interesting to have seen how it would have worked if you stabbed like the Lord Ruler through into somebody else. And that would have been so thing. cool. That would have been so cool to see. Yeah. So Tenzin then looks out at the caverns, knowing that there's much too large for the amount of. Uh, knowing that the caverns are much too large for the amount of Chandra, but that the Chandra like the solitude after serving masters and contracts. He then notes the way the different Chandra generations treat him uh, while in his cell. The fourth and fifth spit at him to show that their devotion to the seconds. The sixth and seventh shake their heads in pity, and the eighths and ninths come to gawk at him as he's so much older and have, had fallen so far. We then get Melon showing up. Tell, Tensu hey. tells her to go and to not see him like this, but Melon angrily says that they shouldn't be able to treat him like this, as he is nearly their age and he is wiser. Tensu just replies that the seconds lead them, and Melon replies that they don't have to, and that Tensu could challenge them. Oh. Tensu replies that they are of preservation, and thus they will follow order and not be rebellious like humans. Melon then says that Tensu was right about what is happening above. The ash is falling more, and the mists are coming out during the day and killing people. Tensu replies that the first will do something, but Melon says they are old, forgetful, and impotent. He replies that Melon has changed, and she says that the Sevens would fight against the Seconds for them since they were raised by a third. Uh, do you think Tensu should try to take control away from the Seconds? Yes. He deserves he it. Lead. As king of the Conjurer. Yeah, I think he should lead the Conjurer, for sure. <laughs> uh, Tensu then thinks that the Seconds likely know of the allegiance of Melon know of the allegiance of Melon and have a fourth and fifth with the blessing of awareness, listening to what is being said at his cage. As blessing they can listen, of awareness. As they have a, can listen at distance with the blessing of awareness. He worries about Ruin returning and tells her that he broke contract, although Melon says it was for a greater good and Tensun is glad he at least convinced her. Yeah, what were your thoughts about the blessing of awareness? Because now we know two. We know the blessing of potency and the blessing of awareness. I already knew the blessing of awareness. I'm pretty sure we only used the, the one. The potency one is the one where we learned from uh, Orisir. Yeah, we learned about, we learned about the potency one um, because when Tensun is dragged up from his uh, from his uh, pit, he notes that the second or I think no, I think it's a fifth that comes to get him. Uh, they have the blessings of potency, which makes them stronger. Uh -huh. Yeah, but they discuss what blessing or so, so uh, basically... they, they do. They, they, I don't think they. No, they said it. Think... Does he Would also they? have potency? He doesn't. He has a different one. Yeah, it's the one that keeps his that. mind aware or whatever. 
but uh, oh, a presence. I think he has the blessing of presence. It's called. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry, we, know we do. Three. We know three of them. Sorry, I forgot about that one. Yeah, guys, pay attention. I'm sorry. All right, all right, fucking scrambled eggs. Eh? Yeah, yeah. He, he has the blessing of presence. You're right, because he, he he won't go insane. His mind is too aware. And but yeah, and then there's also the blessing He's of potency, which we matching up really well with Alamancy. <laughs> so we got three. Tutor ten. Uh, well, it's gonna here. be like what sixteen blessings? Probably yeah. Sixteen blessings, sixteen medals, sixteen, 16 people, people dying. Allergic, you know, sixteen out of people allergic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, you're right. Sixteen people. Oh my god, sixteen percent. That's my theory for the fucking sixteen percent, bro. Uh, all the metal. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. one of my questions at the end here is going to be, what are your theories about this sixteen? It was there? gonna be. Now it got answered. Well, <laughs> we'll still talk uh, about it at the end here. Answer. Uh, did a good answer, though. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so Melanin says that Orisir had the blessing of potency, but the seconds hadn't found it on him. She asks that they can, if she can go get it for him. Tensun says he won't fight his own people, but Melanin says someone must lead them. Tensun thinks that their creator should be the one leading them, but they were dead, so instead someone new had taken their place. Melanin asks if he just came to share the news and lead them to figure out the rest. He shakes his head and says that Zane, br- and she says that Zane broke him. When Tensun says sh- he didn't, she asks about the dog bones. He replies that Vin oh. gave him the bones, and Melanin accuses Vin of breaking Tensun. He then thinks there might be a possibility of escape. He asks Melan about the dog bones, and she asks why he wants them. Tensun replies that he doesn't, and he carefully chooses his words as he calls the dog bones disgusting. Tensun then tells Melan to leave him be, and she says he used to be one of the greatest of them. Tensun, however, thinks that he was actually the most conservative of his generation, and now he is the greatest criminal. But he did it mostly by accident. He wasn't great, he was foolish. Uh, do you think Tensun is going to be able to figure out a way to escape? No, I think he's going to lead the fucking Chandra. I think he means by, like, escape the cage. Yeah, yeah, probably escape the cage, but I mean, then he's, I think he's gonna overthrow his own Lacandra government, and mm. he's yep. gonna be the leader. And then he's gonna be like, alright guys, I need to leave you, I need to go see Vin. Do you agree, Darkness? Mother. You think he's gonna be able oh, to yeah. escape? Well, I agree on the fucking leading the Conjure part, but... Mm-hmm. Uh, also, do you think Milan is going to keep trying to speak to Tenzun, or after that conversation, do you think she's gonna give up on him? I don't know, she's definitely going back. Probably with the dog bones. What was the question? Do you think Melan will keep trying to see Tensoon, or is she going to give up after that conversation they had? No, nah, she's going to see him again. Definitely. I agree with the dog bone thing, though. <laughs> All right. Our final chapter's epigraph. Uh, it should be no surprise that Ellen became such a powerful Elemancer. It is a well-documented fact, though that document- documentation wasn't available to most, that Elemancers were much stronger during the early days of the final empire. In those days, an Alamancer didn't need Duralumen to take control of a Chandra or Kolos. A simple push or pull on the emotions was enough. In fact, this ability was one of the main reasons that the Chandra devised their contracts with the humans. For, at that time, not only Mistborn, but Soothers and Riders can take control of them the merest of whims. Uh, so why do you think the Alamancers of the past were more powerful? Because that's where the fucking... Um, that's well, how recent the, the little orb was taken, right? Mm. So, like, it got washed down by... Generations. Each generation gets weaker and weaker. Just like in our real life. Uh, So we then have Vin's point of view for this chapter, and we briefly get a confirmation that Demo has survived the miss. Were were you expecting Demo to survive, or did you think that he was going to die? No, I thought he was going to die, but I I was hoping for him to survive. Yeah, I thought he was going to die too. (laughs) I definitely thought it was going to be like that whole thing, you know. Oh, but he's nope, died. He he's the sacrifice. Yeah, he's the sacrifice for Ellen to, you know, rise. I thought it was gonna be like a oh shit, what have I done type of moment, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Vin is sitting on a barge, fidgeting with her earring as the Colas pull the barges through the canal. Most of the barges carry supplies, but some have been emptied to carry the wounded. Vin then glances at Ellen, who is standing at the front of the boat, noting that he is standing like a king and that his uniforms are older now as he's been at war for two years. Vin no. knows. You know, I don't remember if maybe you did, and I just didn't remember hearing it. But uh, when we were on uh, the spook, the very be- I'm pretty sure it was the very first chapter, but about the, the canals that were there that have no water. Yeah, no, I did mention that. Okay, because that's so funny. Yeah, when I was describing yeah, the city, when, when he first goes down yeah. the canals, he says that they they are dried out canals and that they started mm-hmm. using them as streets and stuff. Yeah, okay, I do remember you saying that now. But uh, yeah, I, I remember thinking at this point, I was like, man. 
wonder if theirs is going to dry out too eventually. <laughs> I think they say it's more likely they're just going to clog with ash and just be unusable. Uh, at this point, at least. <laughs> I mean, they'll be walking in mud. <laughs> um, the Vin notes that Ellen is upset by something, but can also tell he doesn't want to talk just yet. So she moves to sit on a bench and take out Elendi's journal and reads a passage regarding Elendi sensing a sentience in the deepness. She thinks that, like Elendi, she had gone into the well thinking herself the hero of ages and had been betrayed, although not by someone with her, but by Ruin. She wonders if the logbook can even be trusted, as Ruin has shown that it can change written words if not inscribed on metal. She thinks Ruin uh. is not omnipotent, though, as he needed to, uh, as it needed to trick her into helping release it. She thinks that normally she would talk to Sazed, to Elend, or Tensoon about this, but Sazed has turned his back on his studies, Elend was too busy, and Tensoon has gone back to his homeland. Uh, yeah, she... that's what he did. <laughs> Uh, do you think Ruin has changed anything in the logbook, or does he just not think it's anything in there important enough to change? I'm sure he's changing something, I'm to be honest. Only the things written in steel can be trusted. Yep. They're in metal. We learned so that the hard way. Metal. In steel. I'm pretty sure it's just in metal. Uh, he, it was, he, in, it was so, in steel in the beginning. It, so he specifically says, I write this in steel as nothing, as only things written in metal can be trusted. So he wrote in steel, but he says any metal can be trusted. I believe is how it's worded. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so Vin thinks that she needs to take on a new role instead of just being the knife. She needs to figure out this puzzle. She thinks about how Kelsier used to say there was always another secret. She thinks about how Kelsier had broken down the idea of defeating the Lord Ruler into more manageable pieces to make them possible possible. So she decides she needs to do the same with this new task and figure out the facts. Vin thinks about what she knows about Ruin, dismissing several things as just assumptions. She thinks that it doesn't seem to be able to do anything at once, as there are rules. She then calls up to Elend and asks him what the first rule of Alamancy is. He replies that she taught him the first rule of Alamancy was consequences, such as weight distribution and pushing and pulling on metal. Then thinks that Ruin's actions are similar. They have consequences. Although she couldn't recognize Ruin's logic, she could feel that it was there. Elend continues to speak on, saying he likes Alamancy because it is natural and always has a consequence for each action, and it makes simple, logical sense. Uh, Vin thinks out loud, saying that this is important. She thinks that Alamancy and Weather are forces that have rules, and that Ruin is also a force. She needed to learn the rules that Ruin follows so that she can learn how to beat it. Uh, what do you think about gods having like to follow like natural rules and laws? Just like yeah. Weather and such. That there is a higher and lower, you know, form of power, I'm sure. I think it has to do more with, like, domains. What do you mean by that? So, like, let's say if Ruin stepped out of their bounds and instead did something against their nature, which is, like, building a giant, like, farm to help feed all these people instead of destroying one, mm. it would technically hinder them, like, their power. Because mm. it's not, like, their domain. So you think they're, like, bound by the nature of their power? Yeah. Because even if it's, like, mythic says where like there's a higher power that all the other lower powers have to like follow there's gonna be like an equally higher power to like you know mm. fuck that up mm-hmm. possible checks and balance system <laughs> uh so Ellen calls Vin's name questioningly as she is silent for a minute and Reen's voice is in the back of Vin's head telling him that Ellen, uh, telling her that Ellen thinks she is plotting against him she tells Ellen that there, it's nothing important and that she no, and thinks that she no longer listens to Reen's voice and that she can see that Ellen trusts her as he gives her a nod in reply. Ben then gets up and stands next to Ellen, who puts his arm around her. She asks what he's thinking about, and he replies that he's becoming like the Lord Ruler because he is sacrificing men for tactical yes. advantages. He states that he feels brutal and that all tyrants state that they are doing bad things for the greater good. Ellen states that he never wanted to be a ruler like this, but he has to be. Green's voice whispers to her that ruthlessness is the most practical of emotions, but she ignores it. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> uh, she tells Ellen that he's been listening to Set too much, and Ellen replies that Set speaks logic and that he provides a balance to him like Tindwell had. Ellen then speaks about alimantic snapping and how noble families would beat their children nearly to death once they got to a certain age to see if they were alimancers. Ellen states that he remembers his own beating and how his father had watched. He also says that most of the beatings were pointless, as even most noble children weren't alimancers. Vin says that he stopped those beatings, but Ellen says that he was wrong. They got rid of one of their most powerful resources, new Alamancers. He had made beating uh, children to see if they'd snap illegal, but what if those beatings ended up saving lives? Ellen says that Kelsier had been beaten as- if Kelsier had been beaten as a child, he may have been able to save his wife. Vin replies that if that had happened, he wouldn't have overthrown the final empire, although Ellen asks if they're really any better off now. Were you going to say that, Mythic? Consequences. If, if 
I mean, there's no there's no saying in my opinion. I don't think I honestly don't think the uh, snapping in the in the prison was uh, an actual snap. I think it's more like he might have ingested something else, mm. uh, like maybe one of those beads that Ellen did, and uh, became a mistborn, and he was like uh, misting or nothing at that point. So uh, my question here is, what do you think about nobles beating their children? I believe it says even before they hit puberty to see if they are allomancers. To be fair, if you're a noble, a noble having a like allomancer in your family is going to be like a big thing. So you want to find out as soon as possible, as soon as so as you can possible, gloat. Yeah. yeah, you can gloat to all your friends, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you, Do you think then that Ellen should not have made the beatings illegal so that they could have? No, more I still think beating children is terrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We don't beat children on this podcast. They should wait at least we until o- We years. only beat people who look like children named Minda. <laughs> wow. Oh. Uh, they should, yeah, they should do it height-based. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, Minda states that she beat doesn't... Beat the small ones first. Minda states she doesn't like this hardness in Ellen, and he replies that he doesn't let it control him. Even though he thinks that he can understand why the Lord Ruler did certain things, it doesn't mean that he agrees with it. However, his understanding of the Lord Ruler worries him, and he asks Finn if he ever stops being willing to give up the throne for what's right to tell him. Ellen ends the conversation by saying they need to find a balance. Uh, Finn then glances around and sees Norden, the obligator, uh, who's been hanging out with her group. He's smiling. He's smiling. Man, he's always over. smiling. Yep. She, she's like, I used to think like, a happy obligator was bad news, but he, he's just, he, you just can't, apparently you just can't be mad at Norden. Norden's just a happy guy. Uh, he apparently also wears large spectacles as if to cover the tattoos around his eyes. Uh, and Ben thinks that Norden proves that even in the most evil of organizations you can find good men, and that he had most likely just lived his own little scholarly world while uh, working as an obligator. Uh-huh. Uh, Norden then tells Ellen that he had finished his count of the sick and dead amongst the soldiers. Ellen glances at Norden's numbers and tells Ben that of their 38,000 soldiers, nearly 6,000 got sick and 550 died. Norden notes that uh, one of his own scribes even died. Ellen then mentions the numbers are less than expected. Uh, so what do you think they're going to do about having almost 6,000 men sick that they're like having to carry on these barges? What do you mean, what are they going to do about it? Like, I mean, they now have like a whole bunch of fucking sick guys. How long do you think they're going to stay sick? Who knows? It's a lot of guys. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think you've had more. I mean, they can get there in, you know, in one piece. So, well, I mean, have, it's not like they have a space issue. Do you have any thoughts, Darkness? Number of men who were sick. What's gonna happen no, with them? Right. Really? I figured yeah. they would just recover. They seem or... to recover eventually. I'm just saying, like, they're they're trying to like go and like besiege places and like do all these things. They're like about six thousand sick men right now. There's no way they send them into battle. But that's only that. six. That's only like sixteen percent of your force, though. <laughs> I mean, it's technically thirteen point five because apparently some of them had already Whatever. been. Uh, already, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I'm just saying, this. like the the. Only 16% of your force got sick. You got a lot of fucking people then. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Vin asks how they know how many should have died. Norton replies that they've been tracking the numbers. He starts to go on a bit of a rant, but Vin cuts him off and asks him about the specific numbers. He states that exactly 5,243 soldiers fell sick, which is about 13.5% of the soldiers. However, Vin finds out that this is the percentage from the total number of soldiers, not just the total number that had been in the mist that hadn't been in the mist before. Ellen starts to say that he doesn't see how that will help, but Norton looks up and states that, surprisingly, the number of men that fell sick of the ones that hadn't been in the mist was exactly 16%. Ellen states that this is just a coincidence, but Vin insists he double-checks his other records. Norton does so and says it is, again, exactly 16%. He states that one of them isn't technically exactly 16%, but that is because it was uh, a smaller number that wasn't perfectly divisible, and that a fraction of a person obviously can't get sick, but is as close as possible otherwise. Ellen asks how they hadn't noticed this before, but Norton says they had, they just hadn't realized how accurate this 16% was. Ellen says this is wrong and that the numbers should at least affect the sick and elderly more than the healthy. However, Norton says it does do this technically just with the deaths, not with the sickness. Mm-hmm. Norton explains that they've been paying so much attention to the number of people that have died that they hadn't noticed how exact the number that falls sick is. Uh, so what did you think about the number of sick people being more impor- being important, but some of the number one person dead? in at a time. One person in at a time. They only have a 16% chance to get sick. <laughs> and die. Um, to be fair? Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> if you see it like that. I was going to say, though, like, what did you think about the fact that the number of people being sick matters, but the number of people being dead doesn't seem to have a specific number? Sounds like they're sick. Like, if if I give, you know, a population a sickness, some of them are going to be able to be immune, some of them are going to fight it, and some of them are just going to die from it. 
So if only sixteen percent, if I can, if I can make it so only sixteen percent of somebody of a population got sick, of course, then there's like a you know fifty fifty chance whether they survive or not. So I just gave you the sickness. I didn't you know kill you. Okay. Do you have any thoughts, Darkness, about the people number of people getting sick being a specific? They they say the sixteen, right? It's sixty it's percent exactly. Fucking, yeah. It's just yes. the fucking number of medals there, are, everybody. Oh, uh, there's a lot of 16 references for sure. Uh, but... So Ellen tells Norton to go around and double check his notes, just in case Ruin has changed something on Norton's papers. Uh, Norton asks what happens if this isn't a coincidence, and Ellen replies that he doesn't know. Vin thinks that this means that there, uh, that there are consequences, rules, and laws. She just wonders why it is 16%. Uh, so you guys think that the my, my question here is going to be, what do you think the significance of 16% is? Do so you think it's because it's it's related to the number of metals? I do, yeah. Or, or I think just 16 is just synonymous in general to the entire world, and, you know... You think it's got... just, like, a over overarching kind of important mm-hmm. number, and that's yeah. why you think there's 16 medals. I think I think Brandon Sanderson just likes 16%, or 16 as a number, you know? Do you think it's just I'll a number he 16. likes? It, it doesn't actually mean anything? Oh, no, I, I'm sure it has some significance in the story, but, like, he's the one writing this, mm. so... Like it, it probably has some significance in the story, but he wrote it, mm-hmm. so to him it has no. I'm sure out of the book it had no significance to him. He mm-hmm. was just like, you know what, sixteen, it's a good number. I'll make sixteen medals. I'll make sixteen this. I'll make sixteen that. You know, and then he was like, oh, you know what, I gotta figure out why it's sixteen percent. So let's give it a in, you know, in story reason. You know. Uh, so overview question. Oh, that was definitely one of my overview questions. But overview questions. We've done all the chapters. Um, so besides that, I also have. What do you think is going to happen when Spook meets up with Sazed and Breeze? So that's where they're I'm going opening. To him. I'm opening meets up with Marsh first and steals all his spikes. So <laughs> you think Marsh is gonna be up there instead? I think Marsh actually is in the uh, north, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Yeah. Oh yeah, Mar- Marsh is kind of close by. Well, he's, yeah, I think he's so closer maybe, to the terrace. Maybe, but... maybe uh, he'll send. He'll, uh, he'll meet Marsh again, and uh, Marsh will be like, oh, I need you to take all the spikes out of my body. <laughs> and then, he, and then uh, Spook will put them in his own body, and he'll be amazing. And he'll be controlled by Ruin. Hopefully not. Maybe uh, he'll, be, he'll be controlled by uh, himself or uh, Kelsier. That'd be cool. Mm. I think Kelsier can teach him how to be an iron steel savant. Do you think, uh, Darkness, did you have any thoughts about what's going to happen when Spook meets up with Saced and Breeze? I think that's gonna. Mm, I feel like he's gonna have the spikes by then. Mm-hmm. That's assu- assuming, obviously, that he gets the spikes. But yeah. so you think it's gonna take a uh, breeze and seized a while to get there? We're gonna have some yeah. spook just getting some spikes before that mm-hmm. happens, All right? Yeah. Uh, I definitely think he's gonna kill the other people first. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and we kind of answered my next question. I th- uh, my next question was, what do you think Ten Soon plans to do after he escapes? And you guys said that, uh, or I said, or if he escapes, and you guys kind of said you think he's going to try and take over, like yeah. Melon was asking him to do. Yeah, well, I, don't, I don't know if he's if that's like his thing, you know, like that's not what he wants to do. But you think it's think what's going to happen? Yeah, I think he's going to end up being the one that you know leads them in some way, shape, or form. Honestly, I think he just needs to take out the seconds, and then uh, first don't seem terrible. So, and we know nothing with the first. They just sit there and do nothing, uh, as far uh, as we know. That's what I'm saying. They, I mean, honestly, they feel like they're already dead. That's uh, what I'm feeling like. I feel like the seconds are really the only ones in command. They just wanted everybody to think that the first are kind of help, you know, giving them like puppets. Like I said, yeah, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. So, I mean, I feel like that's how it's gonna be you know he's gonna go like maybe he escapes he goes he tries to go to speak straight to the first you know to the first and then realizes that they're actually just dead damn uh did you have any thoughts about where ten soon's stuff is going darkness yeah i think he's just gonna expose the sec expose the second the first ones are like puppets and he's gonna take over uh, and then my final overview question is do you think vin is gonna be able to figure out how to defeat ruin is she kind of like well, yeah. To figure out his rules. I think I think eventually somebody's gonna figure out how to defeat Ruin. You know what would be really, really sad and upsetting, and I would literally hate this book if they do it. What? Ruin wins. If they make um Vin Ruin's host. Hmm. And Saves has to kill her. No, and Ellen has to kill her. Damn, that would suck. 
Yeah, uh-huh. the way she said that, I feel like it might happen. <laughs> what do you mean the way I said that? Yeah, damn, that would suck. <laughs> uh, so that was my last overview question. Do you guys have any more theories or speculations you wanted to discuss? Macaroni Brain, do you have any? I'm out of theories. I've been through, like, so many already. <laughs> yeah? Oh, man. I'm surprised you've been straining your Macaroni Brain so much. <laughs> How did it go from fucking scrambled eggs <laughs> to macaroni? <laughs> I'm hungry, right? God damn, sue me. Uh, darkness. Anything? No, I said no. Okay. Nope. All right, that is the end of this episode. Then, uh, for next mm-hmm. week, you guys will be reading chapters twenty-two through twenty-nine. Read the rest of the book. Got it. Nope. <laughs> twenty-two through twenty-nine. You're the reading book, a lot right? of chapters. Hmm. Did you say darkness? I said we've been reading a lot of chapters. Yeah, it's because they're all shorter. I think I, I mentioned that earlier. Is shorter? Ms. Gar- I felt like I read for hours. No, because the upper graphs are fucking long as shit. Yeah, because the upper graphs are long. It's though literally the same amount of pages we normally read. It's literally just like I'm going through my book and like some of these chapters are like five pages, whereas in previous books they were like twenty pages. So, hmm. it's they just have really short chapters for some reason. This one, so feels like we're going through them but this has more chapters overall than the last book so it's yeah and not that it's like only about 50 page difference mm-hmm. in length um but yeah so those are gonna be our chapters for next week look forward to that i'm sure mythic's very excited that we've been getting spook point of views yeah, we'll get way more now because he's the main character <laughs> he's a main character he's much more of a main character than he's previously been in this book. He is a main character. That is it. That is, he's, he's the, the only one. He's a main character. He's the only one. No, because the book's not all in his point of view. <laughs> no, nope, it's the only main character. No, everybody else is just side supporting characters. We just need to know what they were doing so that they, you know, we know how they support. Does that mean Spook's actually the hero of ages and not Sazed? They're all the hero of ages, as I've already stated this. <laughs> Alright, well... There is no hero of ages. It's a title given to everyone. As long as they are helping the world in the end. <laughs> Alright. They're all heroes of ages. Well, thank you to everyone who has been listening. We really appreciate it. And we hope you tune Get in, in the comments. next week. Bye! Bye! Bye.